Andrea Beatty, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is Jackie Bowling, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. This is Jeff Riggles of Storm Products and TheEleventhFrame.com. You're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is EJ Tackett, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Welcome to The Bowler Show, featuring interviews with the biggest names in bowling today. Tonight, we're joined by Inside Bowling CEO and founder Mike Flanagan the creator of Bullstream TV, Craig Elliott, journalist for TheBowlingNews.net and Bowler's Journal columnist, Mark London, USBC Public Relations Director, Matt Canazzaro, multiple USBC Open Championships winner and journalist, Jeff Riggles, and PWBA Bowler, the On The Lanes founder and Elite Youth Tour founder, Deandra Asbady. And now your hosts, David the Waz Wazwo and myself, Luke Rosedahl. All right. Welcome one, welcome all to another exciting edition of The Bowler's Show. My name is David Wazwo, alongside my co-host Luke Rosedahl, and we have another exciting show for you. If you've followed our Facebook stuff, you have seen the lineup already, and you may have missed an update. We have the World Series of Bowlers, World Series of Bowling champion, the 100K man himself, Chris Prather, will be joining us at 620, and as uh, you saw in the uh, intro, uh, at 6.40, as always, Matt Canazzaro, then DeAndre S. Beatty, Jeff Riggles, and Mark London. I'm just repeating what Luke did in the thing, but I wanted to let people know uh, through this also. And we are going to go ahead and get started with the show. We are brought to you by SNH Custom Homes, uh, Double J's Pro Shop, Storm Bowling, of course, I Am Bowling, Cool Wick. Uh, Luke, who all am I missing here? Anybody else? Uh, <clears throat> Turbo Bowlers Mart, uh, Storm Motor Grip Bowling Balls for Sale. That's that SS bar. I, yeah, okay. yeah. I it's, can't even do the letters. Yeah, it's there's a lot of them. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and get into it, guys. We got a, an action packed show. We're going to try to put this into two hours. Uh, last week turned into three hours, but we, we are we are going to we're going to pare the guests down a little bit. That we may run long, we may not. We've got a different form, so we can do whatever we want. So we are going to have some fun as we did last week, and we're going to start the show off with the CEO of insidebowling.com the man who has his finger on the pulse of everything that goes on in the bowling world and uh, one of my good friends his name is mike flanagan mike welcome to the bowler show hey is this thing working it is on yeah it is okay. on it, like it. It appears like you have the, the chris Schlemmer <clears throat> cardinals hat on am i is that correct Oh, it's not. It wouldn't fit my head if it was slim. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is a good point before we even get started mike i want to thank you uh, originally when the bowler show started and I was just a fledgling radio, somebody, you were a huge help and, uh, you've always been a supporter of the show and you've always come on. That's kind of the theme of our show today. Other than Chris Prather as guys who've been with the bowler show from day one and especially guys like you who started with me and helped me out and helped me get with uh, storm originally. So first and foremost, thank you for that, sir. Yeah, no problem, man. All right. Tell us, uh, tell us what's been going on at the World Series of Bowling. I know you've been on the call all week. I've been following as much as I could. And once again, we appreciate you taking a little time because I know you've been busy. So give us a little update on how your week has gone at the World Series of Bowling. It's been good. I mean, um, you know, I think the, the, the big thing for me is the players and the ball reps and just the people around me the last three weeks out on the tour have given me a lot of – their time to sit in the booth and and be guests it's obvious that you know a guy like me doesn't know the ins and the outs of what's happening on the lanes and i don't really know equipment all that well these days either so it's always nice when i reach out to ask for help from someone that does know those things that the audience wants to hear that they pretty much say yeah no problem or maybe they reluctantly say no i don't and then they look at me and they go well i can't tell mike no so i'll come in at least for a couple of minutes so uh, that's been really, really nice. And the team I've been working with here uh, has been has been very gracious as well. A lot of the people I'm working with, I'm working with for the first time ever with Flo, um, Brian and Chase. And then uh, we got Jackie Bowling, who was uh, just a what they consider a PA, you know, a, a, produ a production assistant. And I text her on the way and said, hey, you want to be part of the show? You want to bring Jackie Bowling back? And, you know, there's there's no additional pay for that. So she's willing to do it. Um, under the PA pay, but still spend time as an on-air talent. And that that's not to be um, that's not to be taken lightly because 
you know, she's willing to, to give her extra time without being paid for it to do so. So I'm hoping to give her a platform and an opportunity in the future to maybe potentially, you know, maybe get a, get a little better, better role with flow, maybe a little dual role because, you know, 10 years later, since she used to be, you know, lane side reporter, you know, she's doing a pretty good job and she knows these players. So it's, it's been really good. All right. And Jackie made it into our soundbite in our intro. So she's doing really well. Yeah, that, awesome. was, that was uh, something that we had left over from the bowler show. You talked a little bit, Mike, about some of the guys that help you. I've done a little bit of streaming. I did the Lucy in, in 2018. And I understand after hour 33, um, you run out of things to talk about. You run out of ways to describe the, the flat dime. Uh, you end up talking about other subjects and you also bring in people. Uh, for me, and this is an obvious one, uh, Stu Williams was great. Uh, who are some of the, the guys you really, really had fun with this week? Well, I mean, Bill, Bill Spiner spent two days with me um, and he reminded me of Burton so much. It was crazy. Just some of his terminology. I know probably some of the younger audience is probably like this guy's outdated, but man, that really was cool for me. Um, uh, you know, two weeks ago at the TOC, we had Larry Lickstein in, which was pretty good. And, and Brad Miller spent a, a lot of time with me in the booth to the point that the people in the Discord that I set up uh, on my own that people have been asking for Brad. Brad bowled pretty well this week, but wasn't able to knock him down. His score was terrible. So uh, I asked Brad a couple of times if he wanted to come in. And he just kind of said, hey, I'm kind of doing my own thing, which I respect that 100 percent. But uh, you know, Brad and I have good chemistry. We worked together in the past, and uh, you know, we had uh, we had Belmo in at the end of a, a night after he shot 150 and backed into the cut, and his sound bite was awesome. Uh, Simonson uh, hit us up and sat in the booth with us for a block during the uh, Holman Roth doubles, which was great. Roth Holman, I should say. Sorry, go first, but yeah, it's all the guests have been great. There hasn't been one bad one. Okay, along along those lines again, who are who who are some of the worst guys you had in the booth? None, none of them were bad. <laughs> All right, I always none. ask that. I always know that you know the the guest knows that I'm joking because there's no way they would call them out, even if they really had like a, a guy that they didn't like in the booth. But me, it, I'm, it, the worst worst one. One. I'm the worst yeah, one. I'm the worst one. You, you're yeah. like I said. Our, I, I'll give you a quick little story at the Lucy. Uh, Craig Elliott and I were doing it for extra frame and somebody, one of their subscribers called the bowling alley and begged us to stop talking about Olympic ping pong <laughs> because we were discussing why ping pong was in the Olympics and why bowling was because again, we were an hour 31 of 33. So, you know, as well as a lot of people, Hey, you know, I've watched you interview an inanimate object on the, on the air before. And actually that was one of my favorite segments you used to do. Huh. I saw you brought some of the polls back and some of that. So it, it's good. You you do it the right way. You're And you're on there all the time. Some of the biggest critiques I ever hear are, man, there's nobody there for that game. Or that guy just took a three quarters of a game off. I don't know that you took any time off. Yeah, the the analogy I've been kind of using, which is putting me in like, it's not even a fair comparison, but, you know, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning do the Manning cast on Monday Night Football now, where they basically sit back, relaxed, and they talk about the game. And I'm like, that's what I've been doing on inside bowling for 10 years, right? I mean, honestly, we get serious when we need to, you know. Like, if you go back and listen to that that match play round, or not match play, the, the final elimination eight eight player round uh, from uh, Friday night, I, I got off the air and told my team, man, I was really stiff on that broadcast. And they were like, no, you were great. And I think it just felt stiff because I wasn't coming up with the wisecracks or the or, you know, any tangents of any sort, because we were just focused on not players with 93 titles and 20, 24 majors or whatever it was. And it was time to focus on that, right? But during qualifying, I mean, as long as we have the scoreboards up on the screen and you can watch the ball go down the lane, yeah, we need to update you every game on what the standings are in that. But outside of that, my goodness gracious, you know, so – um, I'm not, I'm not everybody's favorite flavor uh, and I get that. And I understand that. But, uh, for the most part, people have told me, of course, it's probably people that are my Facebook friends. So they're my friends, I guess, but they've said, Hey, you know, I, I actually leave you on and listen to you in the background. And I've really enjoyed the last few weeks. So that makes me feel good at least. Well, and you went on Facebook and asked for critiques. You're, you're telling people, Hey, I, I want to learn 
some other things to get better and better myself and with what I'm doing. And standings is one thing. That's another critique. A lot of people when they're watching the streams are wondering, Hey, we, the cuts coming up, you know, give us some, give us something else. Who's shooting what, where it's another thing I noticed that you were always, Hey, what's that guy got over there? What's uh, how far is he out of the cut? Now you always keep them informed on that. So um, I think you're doing a great job and that's not just because you're on the show and you've always been a friend, but you can, you can tell the guys who are there to, you know, have fun and do it the right way. And you're definitely one of those. Yeah. Hey, thanks. I got a question. I got a question for, for Luke. Oh, so yeah. this is part of your show now too. Is that the deal? You Dave brought you in? Um see the thing is Dave has the contacts and he has the history and I have the setup. So it was kind of a nice little uh nice little match for both of us because we were talking about doing a, a specific channel for the bowler show and he's like, Well, that's gonna take forever to kind of build up. You've already got the people, you've got the the tech, kind of the built-in whatever else he's already got all the contacts and the experience and all the everything. And so it was just, it just made sense to do it this way. So well, cheap little piggyback. I've enjoyed your YouTube channel, man. I think you've done a really nice job over there on YouTube. I'm glad to see you part of this show. I hope I wish you guys all the best and in, in everything that you're doing here. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. He has 17,000 built in subscribers already from those videos. Cause look out. He tells it like it is on there too. It's not just one of those, uh, goes long, hits hard kind of guys that, uh, you know, throws all the strikes and yeah, and on the with and, the balls that do go long and hit hard, I kind of feel like an idiot sometimes. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, well, this is this is a this is a staffer dream to describe this one because it does all the it just checks all the little boxes. So yeah, and Mike, as you probably already know, this is the only bowling show podcast, whatever you want to call it, that has ambidextrous co host and co-host. So yeah, that may never happen again in history. That's nice. That's nice. You got that built in. All right, uh, real quick before we get off uh, some of the stuff you did with uh, Flow, or actually, let's get off of that for a second. Talk about InsideBowling.com. That's kind of how you got into streaming originally, and you've taken that further, and you've got uh, some other things that you do with that, with apparel and other things. Other so things, yeah. take take a moment and talk about <clears throat> IB.com. Yeah, I'm like a I'm like a cat. They keep dropping me, and then I land on my legs and <laughs> do something else. Um, yeah, you know, I don't want to bore people with this, but let's just put. <clears throat> way you know i've been given a lot of great opportunities in the bowling industry and i've had a lot of opportunities taken away from me for some reason or another um some of it could be my personality some of it could be the way that you know i pretty much tell tell people what i feel and how i feel about things and i don't mean that to be negative i always try to handle myself in a way that's very professional but if you get me one-on-one -on -one or in a room with executives of a company and they ask my opinion i'm going to give it to them in a closed room i'm mm -hmm. not going to go Facebook and then go off. But I've lost a lot of opportunities in, in bowling. And not one time have you ever seen me go to Facebook and, and offer my frustration, right? I just say, well, yeah. something else is out there better for me. And I wish them nothing but the best. I've tried to be Switzerland throughout my entire <laughs> career. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as, as best as I can. I really, I really have, right? Um, and you know, I got to do what's best for me, just like these companies got to do what's best for them. And sometimes I think the companies lose sight of that, you know, um, but I continue to work in this industry and be given opportunities, mostly on a contractual basis, because I don't want to work or be under some sort of hierarchy of the traditional business model, meaning I don't like to get up in the morning. So you tell me to get there <laughs> in the morning. I don't want to have to be sitting on a one on one with my boss saying, you know, everybody else gets here at nine in the morning and you come rolling in at nine 30 or whatever, you, whatever time you feel like it. Well, I'm also not watching the clock at 5 PM and having smoke coming off the tires, leaving the parking lot to get home. You know what I mean? So I'm just a different beast. I, I'm a true entrepreneur and I need to be working for myself and, and collaborating and working with people. So those in the industry that still continue to offer me jobs and stuff, I mean, I'm going to do the best job I can. I also have a team of people, graphic designers, video editors, social media experts, you know, we just keep doing that. Um, but I'm really happy to see that um, within the industry right now, I've got a pretty good rapport with just about everybody uh, or I've repaired oh. some of the relationships out there, or at least I feel that they're on the right path. So all that's really, really good. So InsideBowling.com, yeah, you know, we've we've got over 100,000 um, people that we can reach that are bowlers across all of our platforms. Um, being 42 years old, I'm not on TikTok. Uh, I probably should be. And if I was still, if I was still working intimately with 
with uh, some of the larger social media contracts that I had, I probably would be, uh, but I'm just not. Uh, so, you know, right now, yeah, we, uh, we print t-shirts out of our house now and we do that for a lot of people and we've really branched outside of bowling. So that's a large growing part of our business. Uh, but then again, we also, you know, put out a lot of content and media on our inside bowling YouTube channel, which is like 55,000 subs. We started backstage bowling. And I still help BowlerX.com. BowlerX.com is uh, one of my clients, and I, I, I help Lee and Krista, and we collaborate and work together to grow their brand, and we've done very well in the three years together. Um, and then I do many other things. You know, I just do many other things that I really don't need to get into in this show here, but we've got, you know, 11 revenue streams coming into the inside bowling LLC business, and Really, quite honestly, I'm not that public with a lot of the stuff that I do because it's really not necessary to take the credit. When we work with a client, we put the, we put the content out there and uh, the client usually comes back and says, you under promised and over delivered. Thank you very much. Here's your check. And then we move on and wait for the next one. All right, Mike, as you may or may not know, we have the 100K man. Yeah. Also known as Chris Bray. They're waiting in the wing. So I'm going to turn it over to Luke for a second. He's going to pop a question or two for mm -hmm. you and then we'll uh, let you get out of here. Perfect. Yeah, I was uh, I was putting together that intro, and I'm like, well, Mike Flanagan and Inside Bowling, and then he does this, then he does this, and he also is involved with this and doing this. And I'm like, well, I can't really have a five minute intro here, so I just Inside Bowling. So, Perfect. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I, I've got several social media channels myself, and uh, I have heard people say, oh, well, Flanagan's on on Flow this week. And so it's going to be a good week. And so I've got people that aren't on your, there may not be on your Facebook friends list that, that still tell me, Oh yeah, I need anytime Flanagan's on, it's going to be, because I mean, you've got to reach so many different people. You have the traditionalists that just want to see bowling and talk about bowling. And then you have the people that can see the bowling and they want some interesting commentary. And so how do you kind of, you do it very well, but how do you kind of strike that balance between giving are you trying to reach every audience possible? Yeah, I kind of just trust my gut. And I, you know, I, I, I like, I'm inspired by Dan Patrick. I'm inspired by um, the TNT guys inside the NBA. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. And like the Manning cast. So I try to mix as much of that and uh, ABC television, uh, Chris Shankle, Bill Burton, as I can. Um while still trying to do it my way, you know? Yeah. That's and do you cool. ever, do you get a chance to do much bowling yourself anymore? It's kind of a funny thing that uh, people assume that once you're in the bowling industry and you're always in a bowling alley, that you do a lot of actual bowling, which kind of, I think, flips the other direction. So how, how active are you still? Do you still get out to like nationals or local tournaments or uh, um, how much do you actually get to bowl? Honestly, I bowl in the, in the instructional videos on Thursday when they need somebody. Um, <laughs> and I perform extremely well under those circumstances because we got to get it done very, very quickly. Um, yeah. But no, I don't really bowl anymore. Um, uh, I'd like to, but do, and what I always told people back in the day when I lived in St. Louis was when Tony La Russa was the manager of the Cardinals, I would say, hey, after La Russa gets done managing a game, you think he wants to go play softball with his buddies? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike. Uh, as we let you go, I'm going to let people know how to find my favorite Mike Flanagan video on YouTube. Oh, boy. Just search the 1997 GSLBA Ed Sweeney Scholarship winner, <laughs> and you will not be sorry. Trust me, it is one of my favorite videos to watch every once in a while. If you want a younger version of Mike Flanagan and how he started and with what he's doing now, it'll kind of tell you the story. So. Yeah, that one's going to be moved to private as me as soon as I get off. <laughs> Too late, oh, you guys. Yeah, yeah, you're out. You better move quick now because that's out there. Hey, you got 87 views, so <laughs> I'm not sure you want to shut that one down. But Mike, anyway, uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time here. So yep. uh, once again, I, I want to talk about the old days real quick and just thank you for what you did for me and yeah. getting this going. That we, to be honest, we wouldn't be here tonight doing what we're doing now without that original start in 2013 ish, 14. Uh, until 2017 when the show went down. So thanks for everything you've done for us, and thanks for everything you do in bowling. Uh, you bet. And uh, Prather uh, finally finally broke through as a number one seed. He, he broke the seal. He broke the streak. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to what he has to say to you guys.
All right. We will let you go, sir. Thank you very much for joining the Bowler Show. Have a good one. All right. See you, Mike. All right. Mike Lanigan starts us off today, Luke. InsideBowling.com, Director of Marketing at Bowler X, Backstage Bowling. Pretty much anything that's going on in the bowling world, yeah, like he said, he's got his hand in. If there's streaming going on somewhere, then he's probably going to be involved in somewhere or another. No doubt. All right. Uh, we, we ready for Chris. We want to just bring him in now. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, a lot of you saw him today on the World Series of Bowling. And uh, as Mike Langan just said, he had a little uh, one seat issue that he took care of, more than took care of today. Uh, once again, taking home $100,000 in a tournament. Uh, he is Rotogriff staffer Chris Prather. Chris, welcome to the Bowler Show. What's going on, guys? How are y'all? There he is. All yeah. right. You were you were the main event. First and foremost, congratulations, sir. That was fun to watch. Yeah, thank you. It was a fun experience for sure. Yeah. All right. Luke and I were running a tournament here today in Kansas City, and we watched as much as we could. I, we definitely saw the finish. So do us a favor and kind of walk us through the, the latter portions of, of the final mm -hmm. match. Yeah, I mean, uh, going down into it, I had the game plan of just trying to do my thing, throw it slow, uh, as I typically do. And uh, I know that you guys didn't see what was going on in, like, practice, and it's hard to keep track of what people are doing on the lanes. But uh, on tour especially, how the lanes play is dictated by what the guys do in the beginning, right? And from the start, Belmo with his higher rev rate was just making the pair hook a lot, right? He's chewing up the lane a little bit and uh, trying to prevent me in, you know, because he's thinking final match, right? He's thinking title match. How do I want these to play? And on the right lane, he was throwing it kind of slow with a reality, just kind of beating up the front part of the lane and trying to break them down to his advantage and because uh, at points in time during the week I had lost carry uh, as you guys saw a couple of flat tens there at the end um, he took you know he tried to take full advantage of that and forced me further left than what I could get the ball to go through the pins with and uh, last minute decision to jump on the other side of what he was trying to create and use it and uh, you know down the stretch there, I was like, okay, we just have to remember we have to hit it at the bottom, like work. You know, I'm looking at my hand, like do your job. And, uh, you know, just fortunate that it didn't seven ten, and it did nine pin, like going into the final match. I was like, I don't care what I leave. I just don't want a nine pin again, because I know that if I nine pin, I'm that close. And I would just be like, heartbreaking like again second week in a row nine pins are going to cost me and I, and this week i definitely thought it was going to be a, a flat 10 on a decent shot and just didn't get the get, didn't get the carry when i needed to all right as we said you're a roto grip staffer uh talk about some of the pieces you used during the week and then on the show uh typically i used three balls um on the fresh i used a dark coat uh, and then if I went to pairs that didn't have urethane, uh, if they hooked a little bit more, I would throw a UFO alert. And then if they had urethane and I still had to be left and, you know, doing the slow wheel thing, I actually threw a altered reality that we had drilled, uh, five and three quarters from my axis, just so that way it didn't just immediately hook in the front, didn't go super forward down lane. And we just wanted to... Uh, be able to create shape through the front and the middle part of the lane so that way I could get the ball to go through the pins. Okay. Take us through uh, the roller coaster of emotions that you must have been feeling in that 10th frame. <laughs> yeah, the 10th frame. First one in the 10th, I felt like I threw it really great, honestly. Um, wouldn't change anything about it except for the fact that it left a 10 pin when I definitely thought that it was going to strike. Yeah. And uh, the second one, the 10th, I just, you know, fill ball always strikes. Right. And uh, I, I have seen some comments, some people like, ah, Prather's playing the antics, Prather's doing this, Prather's doing that. And uh, saying that it was disrespectful of me to 
put my hand, my, my head in my hands and, and show my emotions a little bit. Like it's one thing if I'm yelling and, and, you know, swearing or, or calling Jason out or anything like that. But, you know, I'm not going to hide my emotions. I, I was frustrated. I'm going to let it show whatever. I don't care. You can think what you want, but I'm just happy that I uh, had the opportunity to make up for a little bit of a, a bad break in my opinion, as far as the flat 10 goes and uh, get the sick four pin messenger into the 10 that clutched up the win. All right. Well, I haven't seen any of that online yet. I'm sure Luke probably hadn't seen too much as we were setting up for the show, but I mean, guys that get when they get done and they feel like, Hey, I'm, it might've slipped away. And especially um, where you've been the one seed lately and haven't, haven't got it done always. Uh, I'm sure that was just true emotions. I'm sure that was nothing, nothing against Jason or anybody. So I'm not even sure where that's coming from. So I, I, I wouldn't even worry about any of the haters. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I just wanted to uh, put it out there that I saw it and know what's going on and don't care. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it at all. I'm going to keep being me and I'm going to show my emotions. And if you don't like it, that's fine. All right. How much experience did you get bowling our Kansas city tournaments and how did that <laughs> get you to the win today? Uh, well, you know, not going to lie. I, uh, we typically mm. end up in the left gutter pretty quick in Kansas city because they hook quite yeah. a bit. So <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's my kind of. Uh, I don't feel I don't feel at home on the lanes until I'm left of twenty at least. So, uh, you know, getting my ball through the fronts whenever they hook a ton, couldn't do it without you. Yeah. All right. Well, before I turn it over to Luke for a couple of questions, I want to know what you think of the gym. I got a chance to see your video. I believe you ended up with two fifty nine, if I'm not mistaken, throwing the last eight. Uh, right now it's my favorite ball. So take a moment and talk about that. Ball. Yeah, for me, I, uh, I actually threw it on cheetah and qualifying just a little bit. It does chew up the front part of the lane and with my little bit slower ball speed in comparison to others, um, where I would use it would be on the longer patterns where I need to actually get the ball to hook early and control the pocket a little bit when they're a little tougher. Um, but I think it's going to be a super versatile ball as far as like where you can use it on the lane, as well as surface adjustments. You can throw it shiny, you can throw it dull and, you know, I think it could fit a multitude of players. All right. Well, I want to thank you for the time that you spent with us today, Chris, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to my co-host Luke Rosedahl. He's got a couple of questions ready for you. All right. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the, uh, uh, you talked about it a little bit with Belmo seems like he plays offense and defense at the same time uh, quite a bit. And so we noticed that you were throwing the dark code on the right lane, the UFO alert on the left lane. And despite being both asymmetric, the dark codes got quite a bit stronger cover. So uh, mm -hmm. what was going on with the difference between those two lanes? Um, well, the whole week, uh, even in the different bay, the right lane has been tighter uh, for me specifically. So I've, been throwing the stronger ball on the right lanes and uh it's not unusual for me to throw two different balls at a different point in time because a lot of people play the lanes uh based off of them being the same right but mm -hmm. out here on tour and realistically anywhere uh you're bowling on a sport pattern i like i like to look at the left lane as its own individual type of entity right and then the right lane same way right so a move that i make on the right lane is not going to necessarily work on the left lane so it was just a last minute game time decision uh we said okay belmo threw more shots on the right lane than the left lane and he also played for the left on the right lane than the left lane let's flip-flop it throw the stronger ball make sure it's going to pick up get on the other side of where he was at and just use all of that friction that he built up to make sure that my ball hooks and goes to the pins. And worst case scenario is the ball starts to hook a little too early, which is what we saw towards the end. Like if I had another game, I would have switched to the UFO alert on the right lane and actually went to the dark code on the left lane because I got far enough left and there wasn't enough friction on the left lane. So I needed the stronger ball. 
And on the right lane, it was just the opposite. They started to hook too much, and the ball started to burn up. So I needed the cleaner ball to store more energy and go through the pins. So had I had another game, it would have just done the same thing, but flip-flop the balls. Yeah. So uh, uh, you're no stranger to winning when there's six figures on the line. And, you know, people say that, uh, you know, Belmo always gets up for the majors. And is there anything to that? Or is there just kind of a very fortunate and lucrative coincidence that uh, you seem to do so well when there's so much money on the line? Uh, I think the big thing that helps me is that I don't think about the money too much. Uh, it's just always been my philosophy that we're here to win, not necessarily like win the money. Like I just enjoy the feeling of being the best, right? I enjoy the feeling of winning and the money is just the bonus, right? The money get the, the money gets you the 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 boats and the cars and house and you know pays the bills and makes the world go around and all that other stuff. But as yeah. soon as you start thinking about that and focusing on like, man, I need this one to to pay my rent. I need this one to pay my mortgage. I need this one to eat. It just immediately it doesn't you can't pry it off after that. And I I do believe that my my days in Wichita where I didn't have a job. I had to bowl and win to survive, uh, to eat and pay rent and all that has helped me just appreciate the position that I'm in now and realize like I have a great support system. I have a great uh, company that loves me and supports me in Storm Roto Grip. And I have great sponsors that believe in me to represent their, them well and get them on TV. So all of the money issues are not necessarily irrelevant, but I try not to focus on it at all. And I just say, I want to go be the best today. Let's do whatever it takes to make that happen. And I can't be disappointed with whatever I make in that, in that day. Yeah. And so that's the thing where you're talking about the, the people on the internet talking about the, you know, putting your head in your hands or whatever. And I mean, you're not, you're not there sitting thinking about, Oh gosh, well, I, I might've just, cost myself 50 grand or whatever you're thinking mm -hmm. i threw it really really good and wrapped that 10 and now you just i mean you just gotta sit there and hope for the best but you're i mean you're going after that trophy yeah and in that situation it's not like i'm i'm wishing ill on jason or yeah. anyone it's i'm sitting there and i'm thinking i i could have just shut him out i could have just won and i failed right mm -hmm. i personally did not do exactly what I wanted. And obviously you can't win every single event that you lead or bowl a title for or anything like that. But again, it's just frustration with myself and you know, it, it happens. It, you know, it's going to happen again. Right. All right. Before we let you go, Chris, uh, I've been shirking my duties this week. I tried to watch as much flow bowling as I could. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you did on the animal patterns, the cheetah and the scorpion and the pattern that's named after you. <laughs> uh, well, Cheetah, I think I qualified like ninth. Um, I bowled pretty well. Uh, again, I could throw it a little slower than most and actually create some angle through the front. And I did throw a couple gutter balls on that one in qualifying. So don't think I didn't. And um, Scorpion, I think I qualified eighth. Again, another just consistent uh, qualifying block. Uh, Nothing crazy went on there too much. Shark, though, I uh, caught two just terrible pairs where if you got it to like 9, 10, it overhooked. And if you hit 11, 12, it didn't hook. So I shot like 190 or 2.0 on both of those patterns when everyone else is shooting 225, 230. So I lost a little bit of ground. And uh, down the stretch, I made a little bit of a run, tried to – make the little comeback to get to like the 14 or 15 seed and ended up needing 230 or 240 the last game had an opportunity to strike out for 239 and i think i like had, i think i had scouted a nine pin on the shot previous so i was like okay we'll make a little move you know make the adjustment and then it just shot through it 2410 or 2480 sorry and I'm like, okay, well, if I make the spare, I still got a chance. And I take the two, two eight straight back. 
because I threw straight at it because I was like, I don't know if my ball's going to hook. And I'm just like, all right, well, now I have no chance. I picked up my stuff, put it in my bag, and I just walked out, didn't talk to anybody, signed my sheet, filled out my serial numbers, and I left. And I was like, I just need to get out of this bowling center because the last, like, six or seven frames, I, again, you know, nine pins, making a move, and then it just – goes forever and never hooks and i'm just like okay i threw the ball really well and got no no reward for it and then even made the spare and the ball like backed up to chop it straight back i'm like it's just not my day i'm not meant to make this cut it's okay you know because i I don't know that i've ever made the cut on shark honestly like interesting i i don't know that uh yeah because normally the shark at like eight to 12 on both sides has those strips down the, the pattern. Right. Uh, yeah. So I always struggle. Like when I feel confined and have to like jam it into a spot and you can't just move left and then you get the early hook. And yeah. uh, I typically always struggle when my ball hooks early. All right. We've got one last question for you. And this is on the, uh, this came in from the summit lanes chat window. <laughs> Some it. of our guys who are watching, um, the listener would like to know who is your favorite house member and who is your least favorite house member? Ooh, uh, I've heard this one. Uh, I've gotten this one a couple times. My favorite house member. Um, oh, he's sleeping. Never mind. I can't play a joke. Kevin's over here sleeping. <laughs> Who's uh, in the house currently? <laughs> uh, well, we're in a we're in a hotel uh, this week, um, but it's me, Kevin, and Packy rooming together, and then Darren, Mikey, and Chris are down the hall. Um, Favorite house member, though, probably BJ because he's so dang funny. Um, he just uh, always has the good memes and always sends the best Instagram reels. Uh, least favorite house member? Mm, probably myself. I think I contribute <laughs> the least amount other than just being on TV every once in a while. Uh <laughs> That's a question you didn't necessarily have to answer. I appreciate you doing that. Nah, that's fine. Uh, for me, uh, actually, my favorite house member, and I'm sorry, is actually Packy. Obviously, he's around here a lot. Oh, yeah. And because I, he's I, around I, here a lot, he's also my least favorite. So <laughs> hopefully he, uh, uh, I don't know if he can hear that in the background or not. But uh, no, we, we appreciate you answering shot. that forthright. You didn't have to answer the last part. <laughs> no, nah, that's fine. All right, Chris, if you don't have anything else, we are going to move on to our next guest. I just want to take a moment and tell you uh, congratulations. It was fun to watch. Uh, you know, you're a Roto Grip guy. We're Roto Grip guys. And, uh, you know, we couldn't be happier for you. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, I do see here with Josh uh, telling, you know, saying that uh, he can tell that my mental game is in a better place than a few months ago. And you, you are right. It definitely is. I'm, uh, I, I did struggle there for a little bit, and uh, I'm glad that everybody can can tell. So it shows me that the hard work is paying off. So thank you guys, and thank you for having me on. All right. Well, once again, in such short notice, and right after the show, and all the emotions, yeah. um, letting us letting us spend some time with you. I know how valuable it is. We really do appreciate it, Chris. So yeah. Once again, absolutely. congratulations from the Bowler Show, and we'll uh, we'll keep watching you, and we'll keep watching you pick up those six figure checks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Take care. See you. That is Chris Prather. The uh, I don't know. You want to dub him the hundred hundred K man or six figure man? What what's the best? Yeah, they're gonna have to put out a. You remember when they did the the Mika when Mika won the first? They called it the Domination Hundred K or something like that. Yeah, Major Mika or what? Yeah, whatever it was. That ball yeah. that they put out that had the. Yeah. They might have to have a. He might have to get his own Belmo ball. All right. Well, we'll get the, uh, the Shark 100K or something like that. Oh, my God. I, I would patent that before you yeah, throw yeah. that out there. Chris Slimmer. Yeah, I just gave it to taking, him for free. taking notes right now. Yeah, so uh, that's okay. Chris is a good guy, and we're going to allow him to, to do that. Actually, yeah, we're yeah. doing the show, and I'm, I'm going to – whatever you say, I'm going to say, oh, that's great. But that was great. So Yeah. All right, Luke, let's do this. Let's uh, let's take a moment to, to step aside, and we'll uh, play a commercial or two here. I will turn it over to you for that. Yep, and uh, on the other side, we will have Matt Canizaro. All right. Jackson's Trading is the place to sell all your unwanted precious metals, including broken gold and silver jewelry. They also buy old silver and gold coins, so check them out for all your buying and selling needs. 
Also, did you know that Bobby Jackson's Trading pays top dollar for your unwanted gift cards? You know the ones your grandma got you for Christmas? Bobby Jackson's Trading is located on 23rd Street, just one block east of Nolan Road in Independence, Missouri. They're open seven days a week. Check them out at bobbyjacksons.com or give Bob Foster a call at 816-463-1919. That's 816-463-1919. All right, that was Bobby Jackson's trading. He bowls with me on Monday nights. Bob Foster, one of the, the good guys in bowling. He gives back to bowling and um, pretty much, you know, just all around good guys. So check out his website. Check out uh, everything he's got on there. He's got some really good stuff. And if you look at his Yelp reviews, that's probably the best place to look for yeah. honest stuff. He's like, like 9 out of 10 are all great. So, And uh, the other one is Aaron Ramson, so we don't put any stock <laughs> into that. So. Anyway, uh, hopefully some of our local viewers will get that. Uh, Chris is a good guy, you know. That's good yeah. to see. And and he's bowled our stuff. You've bowled against him. And uh, I, I always like it when our local guys do something like this. And, and yeah. Chris going to Wichita State and bowling our stuff. Good to see. So let's move on. And uh, I don't know. We'll call our next guest the 100 – Dollar man, maybe I don't know. He's he's been 100 diligently hour, hundred hour a week, man. I don't <laughs> actually. That's that's good too. You're on a roll tonight. Uh, I've been watching him diligently working or pretending to work in the silent queue over there. So let's uh, let's bring him in now. He's been he's been working hard this week. The USBC Open Championships just started, and Matt is already writing articles trying to impart some of the things I taught him last year in writing. <laughs> so we will welcome the USBC. Media relations manager. I don't even know if that's the exact title he has. He's he's a man of all titles out there. Matt, welcome back this week. Thank you guys. Uh, glad to be here and have the opportunity. And uh, I can see in the the screen here, it's time to do some decorating as well. But now that you have upped your game, I'm gonna have to up mine. You uh, you couldn't see all this uh, beige wall when, back when we were on the radio, and now uh, it's time to to call in the decorator. So uh, maybe for next week, we'll do a little bit better. All right. Well, it's hard to believe, but Joel Bowler was at, out again. It, it seemed like just yesterday I was out there with with you working, and all of a sudden here we are again. Um, I know you're one of those guys who gets nostalgic, and and when stuff happens with the 100K guys, and of course uh, with the start of the tournament, you start. Uh, you know, it's one of your one of your favorite times of the year. So, uh, talk a little bit about the opening ceremonies. Well, the good news was that uh, you guys didn't have to hear me babble and get all emotional uh, <laughs> talking about what was happening at the uh, opening ceremony. Uh, we wanted to wait until after the march. Uh, we had uh, our march out song and, and some, uh, of course, the, the legal situations with music and such sometimes. And so we wanted to, to let that happen, let the folks on site enjoy that. Uh, and then we dove right into the opening ceremony and, and all of the great content from Jason Overstreet and all the folks uh, who are here to enjoy it with us. Uh, so uh, what can you say, right? There's just something about when the music plays and the doors open and the, the players start marching out, uh, everything else melts away. And then you realize what's about to happen. Uh, you see the, the folks in the stands and, and the hopeful bowlers, and uh, there's just so much that goes into it. Uh, and then seeing all the hard work inside the venue uh, once we're show ready and see it all uh, being enjoyed by those first bowlers coming to town. Uh, of course, every day is opening day, but not quite like that. So uh, that was it. We were ready to go. And uh, just, just taking it in and watching Joe Bowler, listening uh, to some of the, the kind words from all the folks as we got underway. Uh, you can't help but, uh, again, get the goosebumps and, and get excited about the next 129 days. Yeah, you, you know it's real now, and you know that you, you will be there, as you said, for 129 days. Uh, watching Joe Bowler throw, is there any thought of maybe the cape being taken <laughs> off? I know it's hard. It, it, we watched him, of course, he got hurt on the first one. I believe he got seven or eight the second round. Um, you're a man of statistics. How many times has Joe Bowler guttered over the years? Well, I'm a man of tradition. So 100% of the time I'm here, that cape will be on. We even made him put his crown back on last night uh, <laughs> because that is how it has worked since 1951. Uh, and, of course, uh, we joke that it's tradition uh, for whatever Joe Bowler gets on that shot to kind of set the pace, the scoring pace for the year at the OC. Uh, but uh, there's always that first shot. You just you get uh, a little more comfortable. 
Uh, our main thing is making sure that Joe takes off his shoe booties. Uh, that is a lesson yeah. that was painfully learned. Uh, so that's that's number one. And after that, uh, we kind of expect it to be a, a two-shot deal. So we'll call the first one a warm-up. Uh, but seven, uh, in that situation, in the spotlight, under the pressure, uh, certainly uh, is a great uh, great number, and it's a lot of fun no matter what. And uh, Some additions to that tradition here this year. Of course, they will get travel to next year's event in Reno. And then Ryan Grounty and the folks here at South Point really stepped it up, giving him the luxury suite uh, for the weekend. Mm. Uh, so randomly selected. We almost had our first Josephine Bowler. Uh, it came down to the mm. final couple of competitors. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we saw how it turned out. If you didn't, it's still available on our Facebook page. Uh, but there's nothing like opening day. Uh, well, except maybe closing day sometimes, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not ready for that countdown just yet. We're excited about what's coming up. Well, I was in that opening squad room last year when Joe Bowler was picked, and I kind of now understand how, how it's, you know, how you're chosen or how you're not chosen. And I had somebody today asking me about it. I explained that to them. So take a moment and explain to the, to the viewers how, you, how one becomes Joe Bowler. Well, I'm glad you had that opportunity. That's something that you want to see at least once uh, when you're here. And, and I don't get to see it too often because we're always out running around with the photographers or the media. Uh, but it's uh, it's pretty simple. Before uh, the day gets going, uh, the staff here, uh, they put all of the names into a big drum, just like a, a big bingo drum or a lottery drum. Uh, and then they try to drag it out a little bit to make it uh, agonizing and a little bit of fun as well. Uh, there's little capsules in there for each lane that's being used that night. And then within each capsule is the name of all the players on that lane. Uh, and then they'll first uh, have a little fun and, and pick the capsule out and have everybody else sit down and then start reading the names one by one. Uh, and then perhaps saying, uh, David Waswo, you are not Joe Bowler. You have a seat. And so <laughs> – you get excited there for a minute, uh, then they take it right away, pull the rug out, uh, and eventually one bowler standing uh, becomes Joe Bowler for the year. Again, going back to 1951, so uh, a great tradition here at the event. And uh, You get the crown, the scepter, the cape, the whole deal. You get to sit in the big red throne and, uh, and preside over the whole opening ceremony throughout that first shot, uh, and it's great. And just uh, Kevin Olson, Dave, as you know, was uh, part of the tradition for – almost four decades that was his shining moment uh this is the first year that he has missed uh, i know he was at home watching and uh so shout out to him for for being a big part uh, of how much fun opening day is and of course uh, to all the other longtime staff members and all the newcomers as well who now are going to carry those traditions on uh, here at the open championships yeah kevin had a lot of fun with some of the the bowlers as you said he would call out uh hey and congratulations, you don't have to do this or whatever. So um, enough about the first guy bowling, Mr. Joe Bowler. Let's talk about uh, all of the leaderboards right now. I want to know each and every uh, every classified uh, Joe standard and Charlie uh, regular categories. What's, what's, what's the big scores going on? Obviously, I'm kind of joking because there hasn't been much going on yet. But let us know. Uh, let us know what it looks like early on. Well, you know that uh, the first night we had the uh, the highly anticipated agate jitters, right? Getting those uh, those first standings typed up, uh, getting the leaderboard sorted. But we saw a big, big number in the standard division. 2878 uh, was a number that would have been good enough to win in two of the four years of standard competition. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit overshadowed by the excitement of opening day, uh, but a big number nonetheless. We did get a chance to talk to those guys and, and take a photo that was included in the story last night. Uh, and then just based on what we saw at the Bowler's Journal the other day on their first day of competition, some big numbers from our defending champ in doubles, Matthew Anderson, 1527. Of course, when you see a number like that right out of the gate, people get nervous. And because that pattern is the same that we'll see for doubles and singles at the Open Championships, Immediate speculation is that it's going to be super easy. Scores are going to be incredibly high. But you just never know. Those guys are super talented. Uh, way too early to, to speculate anything or, or even wonder. Uh, you just have to go out and, and throw some balls and, and see. Um, but we did see some good numbers in doubles and singles today. I was just working on that story. Uh, Justin Studer from Idaho. Uh, they were part of the Joe Bowler group. 
Uh, they were able to settle in with the excitement last night. 13.89 in doubles. That's definitely a, a terrific effort. He had 7.73 to kick things off. Uh, he was born with his uncle Steve. Uh, they both shot 700 in singles. So they're leading doubles. 1-2 in singles. And he posted the all events number to beat right now at 20.57. So, again, not much different. Not off par from recent years as we've seen. Um, things haven't been too, too different. It's a familiar venue for a lot of the bowlers, maybe a little more comfortable even. Uh, and when you're powered by the, the power of hot dogs, anything is really possible here at South Point. All right. You got a, an agate shot in there and a hot dog shot. Um, Luke, I'll explain the, the agate thing with, <laughs> with what Matt had to work with me. Basically taught me all the ropes and then realized that the agate was going to be the thing that tripped me up the most and the part I couldn't understand the most. So we had a lot of fun with that last year and, and me at two 30 in the morning, trying to figure out what the state abbreviation was for Maine. And actually, Matt, I think you could quiz me. I think I still have those in my head, but we'll do that for another <laughs> show. So Matt, I'm going to uh, step aside here and let uh, Luke take over for a little bit. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with a, uh, with a fun one that you may or may not know yet, but last year when we were there and you know, speaking of the, the end of the tournament, we bowled the last two days last year. We're bowling the next to last two days, or my my teams that I'm going with. So we're going to be there July 16th and 17th, I believe. Um, but while we were there last year, South Point had a BMX competition, a kids BMX competition going on. So what are some of the other? Do you, do you know yet what some of the other fun things might be to do while you're not actually bowling? Uh, there's always something going on here at South Point, and uh, now that we're actually staying in the hotel this year, uh, you never know who you're going to run into. Coming up here, uh, just yesterday, there was uh, some softball players, there were some soccer players in the elevator, uh, some middle school cheerleaders running around. There was a, a motorcycle uh, bid auction situation happening next door. Uh, coming out of the restroom inside the bowling arena today. I'm not sure how it happened, but a uh, young man swinging a lasso around, uh, get, getting ready for some rodeo action downstairs. So uh, there's just uh, there's so many different nooks and crannies and, and exhibit halls, and you really have no idea once you come up those escalators what kind of line or, or what you're going to run into. It could be uh, the tumbling competition followed by the, the monster trucks in the other room. Uh, so plenty of entertainment uh, outside of, the, the of course, the dining and the gambling and uh, the movie theater and the bingo. There's, it's a city. I haven't seen the sunlight, uh, I don't think, since probably sometime last week. Uh, I don't even know at this point. But um, we're, we're well taken care of here. And uh, and now that bowling has begun, uh, Waz, as you know, uh, you know how it works. Uh, you know, and seeing the clock last night turn from 159 to 3 o'clock, knowing there was a 7 a.m. squad coming in, uh, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. And uh, our new marketing guy asked me yesterday, he's here for opening and getting some content for us. I said, how do you do this? How do you get through? And I really have no idea. There's just some sort of adrenaline uh, that gets you going. And uh, all of a sudden, before you know it, uh, because there's really only two days while we're here, right? Opening day and closing day. And that's it. Eventually, you show up and nobody else does. So clearly, the <laughs> event is over. You start packing up the office. But uh, I don't know how we do it. Uh, but uh, just walking around, seeing all the enthusiasm, all the different things, uh, you know, every day is the same, but so different at the same time. Yeah, there's probably some in the hot dogs, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how, how much easier does it make your life? Because uh, last year they had the obviously something that probably hasn't happened before, or at least in recent memory with having to have the kind of split squads, I guess you'd call it. Having everything back in the arena now, how much does that make your life any easier? Does it, uh, what exactly, how much exactly does that help out? Uh, it, it does make it a little bit easier because we don't have staff in both locations. Uh, I was a, a little bit of a funnel for much of last year. Uh, those guys were great at collecting the info, the videos, the photos and things uh, and getting it to me so that I can do what I needed to do. Uh, but now having everything and everybody here, uh, it's kind of better. But at the same time, now we have the Bowler's Journal back at the bowling center. Uh, so immediately uh, they were going for about 30 minutes and the call started coming in. Of course, uh, the superstars were over there bowling well. So um, it really didn't change. I was camera in hand and running back over there. Luckily, we didn't have any squads over here yet. I was able to get over there with some paperwork. Uh, we'll give some lessons to those guys on 
uh, video technique and, and getting some questionnaires. And so they'll be uh, doing some of those things for us, but uh, I think it'll be uh, similar, but different. Uh, and our staff is uh, a little bit smaller this time around too. Uh, Waz, we got uh, Ron is here. He's actually watching the team event right now so oh, that wow. I could be here with you guys. So uh, we've dubbed him uh, our coordinator of longevity. So he'll take care of our milestone <laughs> bowlers this year and for next year. Uh, and then I'll focus more on the bowling part of things. Uh, but he's out there right now keeping an eye on it so uh, we can be here to talk. Yeah, I, I noticed that uh, you talk about the longevity. You ran myself, Sam Neves, and Cassidy uh, Corey out of there, you know, in a heartbeat. And I assume uh, Cassidy's not coming back this year. Is that correct? Uh, so far, um, she's still at school, of course, with Ed McKendry uh, doing the grad school thing and having a, a great time with the postseason in college bowling. Uh, if I had a choice, I'd probably rather be out there as well. Uh, there's no days like the college bowling days, but certainly uh, if she or any of you guys uh, want to show up and knock on the door, we've got media badges galore for you and plenty of work to be done. So you just let me know when uh, when you're <laughs> feeling nostalgic or homesick and, and ready to come back. Actually, my wife is in the same room. We're doing this uh, in a bowling alley right now today. So uh, that's that's already the kibosh has already been put on for that. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to do that, but uh speaking of which you said you're staying at south point this year i know sometimes you're on site and sometimes you're just off site um for anybody who has uh questions about the tournament and can't reach you by email what room are you staying in oh no sir no <laughs> sir do not follow you have to show a room key no do not follow me to the elevator <laughs> <laughs> and we kid i saw i already saw a post this week where somebody asked uh, uh no, there was no really stupid question. We'll just call it a silly question. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw USBC Matt. Uh, hi, you know, welcome to the tournament. This is the reason why this happened, and uh, enjoy. So you're you're already doing uh, your your work on that. And uh, I'll I'll tell Luke a quick story from last year. Uh, Matt was talking about coming back from the plaza over to the bowling center, and on days you know the rare days he actually gave me a day off. Uh, he would inspect the room and and my partner upstairs who would work during the day was Sam and Sam is a, a not a small man either. And Matt came in one day. He's like, what are all these crumbs on the ground? Like you hired Sam and me and you thought there'd be no crumbs. So <laughs> yeah. that was one of my favorite memories from that year. Besides the, uh, the mystery hot dogs that showed up. And then also they, they serenaded me on the way out with uh, a hot dog and a glass of milk. And <laughs> those, those are memories you can't replace, sir. Well, you did ask me if you're doing a crummy job, and uh, you know, so I, I didn't know we were taking it literally, but I'm gl glad to have both you guys there. Of course, it would take you back anytime. And you know what? If you want me to hand it over, I'd be happy to, to do that as well. Just let me know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't take. I don't know if I would take that handoff, but uh, yeah, that, that was the, we had some good times last year, of course. And I know you're a busy man, and I know that you've got a million things going on here, which I didn't realize in the past few years. So. Uh, unless you have something else, uh, I don't know, the Florida Gators doing something in the offseason, uh, anything else you've got to add, let us know, and then we'll let you get out of here. I think uh, we're just trying to catch our stride a little bit, right, and uh, get comfortable and get the rhythm of this new schedule down. Um, you know, we'll have squads pretty much the rest of the way, starting at 7 a.m., and the last squad goes off at 9.30, half team event, half doubles and singles. It's going to be a little bit wacky. We've had that before. Just have to get used to it once again. Uh, as soon as we're done here, I'm going to get ready to post the story about today's doubles and singles. Uh, and then Ron has some action happening uh, in standard and classified team events. So you just never know. Uh, good variety. We'll have uh, we'll have the stories pumped out. We have some videos already. So definitely check that out. Keep up with the event. And uh, and we'll be here day and night to, uh, to bring it all to you. And uh, I will set an alarm again for next Sunday. Maybe again, try to decorate a little bit. Uh, but uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk OC and, and reminisce a little bit each week. Always, Matt. This is always one, one of my favorite segments. It's actually in the top six of my favorite segments of the show <laughs> each week. So uh, we appreciate that. Tell uh, tell Aaron Smith if he's around high and also Ron and, and you know, kudos to him for coming back after being uh, <laughs> driven hard, you know, last year. Uh, we kid, you're a great boss. It was fun to fun to work, you know, all that time because you know i was out there to work I, I tried to you know actually you helped me a lot by keeping me away from the casinos so 
Thank you for that. I, I'm just here to help. That's your membership dollars hard at work. <laughs> I've got your coat back here, just by the way. It's a little warm in here, so I took it off. So, but I wear that proudly, and I appreciate the. You know, I tell tell all my friends I went out to Las Vegas, and all I got was this crummy coat. So, well, come on back. We got uh, we got plenty of other crummy things for you as well. <laughs> I I will be out there June 16th and 17th. Mark your calendar. I expect to be on your whiteboard uh, with uh, all the other dignitaries. So, Matt, doing a great job as always. And uh, as always, we appreciate your time with the Bowler Show. Thank you, guys. Keep up the good work, and we'll see you next Sunday. All right. We'll see you on the lanes, as uh, Matt usually says, after his videos. And uh, actually, he'll say that uh, all, all the time, actually. But uh, Matt Canazaro, USBC uh, P, uh, public, you want to say it? Uh, public relations yeah. manager, media, <laughs> media mogul, whatever. Uh, let's let's get him out of here. here, here. How, how they do that? Else. Get him, yeah, get him yeah, out yeah. of there. Get, get, a, get, a, get a still <laughs> shot of him. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of good times last year. So, uh, Luke, I'm kind of shirking my duties here. Who in the world, yeah. in the we'll world of bowling? You, Matt. Matt, you've still got Matt on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get, him uh, yeah. get him out of here. Bye, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> that, is one, that is one way to get rid of the guest. And uh, Luke and I are working on on some of our uh, segues to our commercials and segues to the next guest. So, uh, Luke, uh, we'll work on that. Yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. is show number two. So yeah, and before it was on the radio, and I could look on the other side of the of the glass and make you know longer, shorter, whatever we needed to do for the segment, or we're going to commercial. Um, this is a little bit a little bit different scenario. So anyway, uh, let's uh, let's let's talk about our next guest here for a moment. We got another storm staffer on the show today, and uh, we're going to check in with the PWBA bowlers here. They're going to be starting back up here in a month or two. And she was a good friend of the show. We're going to stay with the theme here. She was always accessible. She's my second favorite female bowler of all time, and she knows that, and she ho- she knows who's number who's number one also. I'm just going to go on ahead and add her in even, there. So. Even with the face, Deandra knows that Leanne is my all-time favorite. So uh, you know, She's she one of my faves, before. too. So anyway, yes, Leanne, Leanne is great, so. Uh, DeAndre, DeAndre, welcome, welcome to the board. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. What an all-star uh, show you have today. I'm just honored to be on it, following up with Matt and Mike and Jeff and me. Thank you. Hey, there you and go. Wait, was Chris on? We did get Chris yeah. Brayther on, yes. Wow. I yeah. mean, that's amazing. What a show yeah. that was. Look out. Where are we going to well, start? You, you, were in the, you were in company <laughs> that you, that you, uh, you deserve, so. Um, we talked about the PWBA uh, last week a little bit. Uh, with with that, tell us a little bit about your plans this, for this year with the PWBA. Yes, well, I am I'm still going to to be out there. I'm still going to be part time. Um, I'll probably do half the the stops, and I'm really happy that the first two stops are kind of local, Rockford, and. Um, then Addison, Illinois. So I'm super excited. And then Minnesota, I'll also do. Um, not so sure about the Florida stop and the New York stop, but I'll do the majors. And yeah, I'll still uh, get out. I'll, I'll still shoe up. But man, those girls are are good. And um, it's hard. It's hard out there. It's not as easy as it used to be. Now it was never easy. But when I was dedicating my life to it, it was um, <laughs> it was a little bit easier. You know. But that's okay. My life looks different now, and I have no regrets. I'm just glad that I can still compete out there against them, with them. All right. Well, we saw your face there uh, when I said you were my second favorite bowler. We also saw your face on TV when you threw a shot for the tiara, and you weren't sure it was going to make it back. It sawed off the five pin, and it made it. The rest is history. So t- tell us a little bit about that moment in history for you. Oh, man. Um, you know, it was I, a lot of what a lot of people don't realize is that um, that was a really significant event, not just because I won, but I was a new mom. And it was the first time in my life that I was feeling a little bit mediocre at most of the things I was doing that I wasn't used to, you know, spreading myself um, thin like I was where I was trying to be a coach and I was trying to be a competitor and I was trying to be a great mom and I was feeling mediocre um, everywhere. And that was a new feeling for me. So I just remember on my way there, um, 
you know, I think that's something that a lot of women don't really talk oh, about. Gosh. Like, you know, we have to, we have to stop. We, our bodies change. We have the baby. We then, you know, have the expectation of like getting back to where we were and what does my life look like now? And where am I going with this? And there were just so many questions and um, it was confusing for me when I, um, when I stepped into the Queens that year and then uh, I was able to make it and then, you know, fulfill every little girl's dream where it's step up in the 10th, need a strike to win your first major and do it. And I just feel like it was just validation. It was just the universe telling me that you're going to be fine and you, you still can do this in whatever capacity you want it to look like. And um, and that was a really big moment for me and my career. I just remember stepping up in the 10th frame and like in my son who is almost taller than me now, but I think he was like 14 months and uh, I just kind of, he was back home watching, but I, I sort of had a vision of him right before I threw that shot, almost as this, if to say like, it's, it's okay because I've got so much in my life that this moment, although it seems really big, I'm going to be okay either way. And um, I was able to get it done. And so it will always be a highlight in my life. All right. Well, you talked about Jersey and Madden. What's, what's their interest in bowling right now? They um, are very interested in bowling. Madden, Madden's number one sport's always been baseball, um, but he's getting into bowling. You know, it's, he's got a funny bowling story because I'm never really around on Saturdays. So I never was able to bring him to league. And so I just brought him with me to practice. He learned how to bowl. And then I have this elite youth tour that I started and they're competitive, very competitive tournaments and very tough lane patterns. And I just threw him into it. And I'm just like, well, we'll figure it out as we go. So he never really, and even to this day, he's never really seen a, <clears throat> a house shot, which is uh, funny for a kid, you know, that's 11. He, you know, he's only bowled on, on uh, sport patterns and very difficult stuff. Um, so he just had his high game, 232. And my daughter, who just turned eight, I decided that it was time for her to start competing. Um, I was wondering when it was going to happen. But at the end of last year, she was still doing cartwheels on the way back from the foul line. So I'm like, maybe it's just not time. We're going to give it a couple more months. And then a couple more months went by. And I could just tell she she's a natural. She's, she's going to be really good. Uh, I haven't really coached her too much i mean little you know, little things here and there but she just she picks it up she watches a lot she soaks it all in and so she bowled her first tournament ever last month at my event my elite youth tour and when i was announcing making my morning announcements and you know addressing all these great things i wanted to to shout her out because it was a really significant moment to me and i just lost it on the mic i didn't realize it was going to be that emotional but you know when i built this thing i didn't i had I had Madden, but I never even imagined my kids bowling in it. And now they both were there bowling in something that I built amongst all these great youth bowlers. So it was a really cool moment. And then her very first game what became her high game of her life, <laughs> which was, I think, such a boss move that she's just like, oh, all right, I'm just going to shoot my personal best. And this, it's like as if she was just waiting for that moment. So she shot 140. And then the next day I took them to bowl the state tournament here in Illinois and she beat it. She bowled 147. So yeah, I'm excited to see where they go with it. You talked about your joy in coaching kids to step back in time, talk a little bit about your time in Nebraska and the coaching you, you got from Bill Straub. Yeah. I always said that I feel like the most, the most I learned about my game was at the university of Nebraska and it was really where I broke down my game. I realized um, what I learned is that I had a lot to learn and then I learned it. And I'm so grateful for Coach Straub and Coach Klumpa um, for kind of nurturing me through those those college days. I mean, you know, it's like Matt said, some of the best days of your life uh, out there on the college scene. So I feel very fortunate to have won two national championships and bowler of the year and uh, athlete of the year at Nebraska, which was all sports considered, was really something was wow. really cool because, I mean, as you guys know, Nebraska is known for like being really good in a lot of sports, especially mm -hmm. football, but also like volleyball and 
um, there's just so many great competitive sports. And it was the first time a bowler had won that award. And that was really special to me. So, yeah. I, you know, I feel like in some ways it was just yesterday. But my calendar says differently. <laughs> says otherwise. <laughs> yeah, just just a little bit. The time goes fast. And I, uh, you told me you had a chance to to make the short trip up to Milwaukee for the World Series of Bowling. Uh, tell us tell us what you saw. Yeah, anytime um, we can go root Jason Belmonte on uh, in person. You know, I, I, we we're really close to him and his family, and it's just got to be hard to be away from your family for so long. So we just. Um, we always feel like we're his family here in the States. And uh, we went to watch him in Indy uh, when he made that major show. And so we went up and uh, he pulled a great game. I mean, it really is uh, unfortunate when you lose with 250. Uh, but Jason Sterner, he uh, he pulled incredible today. And uh, it was such an exciting show. Did you guys watch? Yeah. We saw a little bit. We were, uh, Luke was bowling my tournament and I was running it. Oh. So we didn't oh, see cool. a whole lot, but we saw the finish. Oh man, you should watch it back because um, mm -hmm. it was such a fun show to be there in person and to have, you know, my, my kids and my husband there. Like it's fun to watch it on TV, but the display of bowling today, all the splits that were made and all the great shots and just, it was, in, it was kind of insane. And then they, they tied for a hundred thousand dollars in a major and they had to best ball it out i mean that's crazy that is like you cannot write it any more crazy but uh hats off to chris he he just he's one of our favorite bowlers to watch out there i just we love his game so he's just he's finesseful um but my heart broke for jason sterner because he just had a, a really good showing, a great showing. And I really felt like today was going to be his day. And, um, you know, that's how quickly things can change. You know, he did not make many bad shots at all today. I think mm -hmm. maybe two and, and a custom. So that, you know, as much as I was really excited for Chris, it was also like bittersweet to watch because your heart kind of broke with Jason. Okay, let's talk a little bit real quick about your preparation coming up for the PWBA tournaments. Uh, how much have you got to practice and have you got to throw any of the, the new pieces from Storm Roto? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm excited to throw that gem. I haven't thrown that yet, but it is going to go get drilled. Um, I am sort of on a two to three times a week schedule right now. And in my life right now, it is all about quality over quantity before in my career it was always it was always about quantity like i have to be there for you know two hours three hours in college it was every day and then after college i devoted my life to bowling but now i'm just practicing smarter and and i think that is um just what i have to do in my life right now so um yeah i'm excited i'm working out a lot i have a personal trainer so i'm getting stronger um I, uh, yeah, mentally preparing and, um, you know, I'm trying to sort out my equipment, but the problem is storm has so many really good balls that it is actually hard to like pare it down. So every year, um, I do a, like build my arsenal webinar with Steve Klumpkin and Matt McNeil. And I look forward to doing that soon because, um, I kind of need to make some cuts and you know, it's hard when the balls are so good. So uh, I love the Helios is looking really good. Um, the Nova, I think really reminds me of the Sherlock and I really love the Sherlock. So that ball excites me. I'm really excited um, to see that on some tough patterns. So yeah, um, I'm going to be drilling up a Wolverine, which I, is the talk of the town. Everybody's talking about it. So I can't wait to see what the hype's all about and and the gem. And um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of easing back into it and trying to create the perfect arsenal. It, it helps that the first couple of events I'm driving to so that I can bring a lot of balls. But when you start to fly around, you have to pull the PWBA will transport nine balls for us. But yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm getting ready. You guys gonna be cheering me on? Oh yeah, of course. Is Leanne bowling? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
<laughs> no, so I should be your number one on tour. Yeah, right? you you are moving moving up. Uh, you're moving up the scale real quick. Uh, before I, I turn it over to my co-host, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't know if she's bowling, but I hope she does because I always love to see her. I, out I, there. I hope she does too because that means her her health is doing okay. So yeah. Uh, before I turn it over to Luke, we saw today on Facebook there is a man. His name is Lou. I can't remember his last name. Uh, he shot a 900 with the Helios. So uh, apparently the Helios Two likes to make a uh, yeah. 900 series. So <clears throat> what? Uh, have you had a chance to throw that? You say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have not shot any 900s yet with it, but I yeah. look to do that soon, hopefully in the future, now that I know that everyone's doing it. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Luke, and then he's going to grill you. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it. Yeah, well, this is pretty exciting for me because I love all things female bowling. A huge PWBA fan um, okay. for forever and... Uh, I'm sure you've been asked this before, but when you graduated college, that was pretty well just about when the tour kind of went away for a while. And so how did that, what was the timeline like there? And how did that kind of change your plans coming out of college? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it was the year that I graduated. And so, you know, that was what was going to be next. You know, I graduated college, I go out on tour and bowl against the best. And um, so I was like, graduated and I did my job and I did it well. And then I was like this young girl, like looking around like, okay, what's next? And then kind of was, was taken from me. And um, a lot of people ask like, you know, do you, are you kind of like sort of bitter at the fact that you didn't have a chance? Because really my peak came in those years that there was no tour, mm -hmm. but the amount of things I was able to do in that time at my peak, they were pretty cool. And so do I feel like I got cheated out of some PWB years? I really don't because at that time, you could not be on Team USA and bowl professionally because it was ah. just for amateurs. And I traveled the world and I won in so many great places and I met so many amazing people and I got to see the culture in so many places and really develop an appreciation for our world that I probably wouldn't have done if the tour was there. And um, I'm also a glass full type person. So I, I don't have regrets in life and I'm glad for the opportunities that I've had in bowling. I'll never be in the PWBA Hall of Fame and that's okay. You know, just, it's not, it's just okay. Like I'm not bothered by that at all. Um, do I wonder how many titles I would have? I mean, I kind of wonder, but I just don't think I'm defined by titles. You know, I, I feel like the richness of my career oh. in all, a lot of different places on Team USA and to be able to win a major at a time where there was no tour. Yeah. That's, you know, I won, I won titles that aren't count, counted as PWBA titles. Like I won uh, a PWBA win, two PWA women's series events mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah. One with Brian Voss, which was super special. And mm -hmm. um, that was his 25th title, which was cool. So I have more titles than it says when you go log on to PWBA.com to me. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it just wasn't in my cards. and uh, But my cards were pretty sweet. Yeah, for those watching, uh, <clears throat> a visit to Deandra's wikipedia page <laughs> would show you that uh she has over 60 international medals from all kinds of different different competitions and so you definitely weren't lacking for anything to do yeah. not being out on tour that's right <laughs> so um and i forgot the next one <laughs> <laughs> i'll tell There's you a, uh, i'll tell you a quick funny story um mm -hmm. When I bowled the world championships in uh, Malaysia, it was 2003, the year that I graduated, the year that I got married. Um, and when I was bowling this event, um, I bowled really well. I like, broke some records. I won the gold medal in the master's event. And um, there was so much buzz going around about this this guy that was bowling. And, and they're like, did you, did, you, did you see the kid bowl? And I was like, what kid? And they're just like, the kid, he's bowling with two hands. The, uh, there's this kid from Australia and I was like two hands like nobody saw it yet so I was like what like granny style what do you mean he's bowling yeah. with two hands <laughs> and I mean it's 2003 
And then I went and I and Jason and I met that year and we became fast friends. And um, I just think it's funny. And I always like to remind him about the time where people only knew me and didn't really know him. Yeah. Because it was short lived. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Because you did. uh, The two of you had um, a lot of videos together. And I can't remember exactly what you were what the, the brand was that you were doing it for. Yeah, we started a coaching company together, International yeah. Art of Bowling, for a short while before we had uh-huh. kids and our lives got crazy. And um, then we did these funny, like, JVD, like Jason versus Deandra. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember those. Mm-hmm. Silly things that people still ask us, like, when's the next one coming out? And I was just like, oh, yeah. I think those, uh, that shit has sailed. <laughs> yeah, you're a, you're both a little busy. So um, talk a little bit talk a little bit about the Beyond the Lanes thing, because I've really appreciated what you've been putting out there recently you seem to be very open and very honest with everything that's going on period exactly what you're thinking feeling and you've got a bunch of stuff going on right now so talk a little bit about that yeah thanks Uh, beyond the lanes was born out of the pandemic you know i finally had time to develop something that i've always wanted to develop and i just haven't because i was just too busy to do it and then there i was in 2020 locked in my house like i couldn't leave and it really gave me the focus that I needed to develop this idea of creating a curriculum around what I essentially the life lessons that I learned in my career that really can apply to anyone, not even just bowlers. And so I hired a leadership psychologist to help me like organize my thoughts and all the things that I wanted to teach. And then I rolled it out uh, in in spring of 2020. um, And the form of like an online uh, class I taught live once a week for six weeks and people showed up and it was amazing to kind of tell them my stories and just um, give them a different perspective and sort of like a personal development way. And um, now people can go to beyondthelanes.com and, you know, I'm really proud of the fact for those that do do like write, um, it's hard to keep it up. And I have really committed to being vulnerable and to writing, um, writing what I'm feeling and, and the lessons that I'm learning. And um, I'm, I think I have 72 week record right now of, of writing a blog. And if you're signed up for my newsletter, you get it in your email, but you can also read it on beyondthelanes.com and various topics. And it's all across the board, but it's honest and it's genuine and it's vulnerable. And um, I get really good feedback from it. So I'm going to just keep doing it. The more fe- the more good feedback I get, because sometimes I'm writing it and then I send it out to my email list and I'm like, I wonder if anybody's going to read this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to hear that you have. So thank you. Keep reading it. <laughs> All right. Well, we started off our interview with me ranking you second on my all-time favorite female bowlers list. Did I drop? So I'm going to give you a chance to rate us of all the podcasts and bowling shows oh, You've been on, where do you put the bowler show? Oh, you guys, you can't do that. I Right now, you're my number one because I'm uh, on your show. Wow. <laughs> Ethan Barnby I, are at the bottom. I I mean, I'm going to take a point off because I wasn't on your first show ever here. And since, you know, like it's the second show, it's like, oh, who was on your first show? Uh, a bunch of nobodies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I couldn't make it. Maybe Leanne probably was, right? No, Leanne, however, did not make the first show. She did not make the cut. So you're ahead I, of Leanne in, mm-hmm. in the reboot of the bowl. <laughs> I think you guys are doing a great job. I'm excited. When I just saw the image of who was going to be on this show, I was I was impressed. And I was like, wow, I can't believe they want me on it, too. So anytime you, you need to fill a spot or if somebody doesn't show, you can always, you know, call me. I always have something to talk about. Definitely. Well, you, you did that back in the day, too, and especially, uh, as Luke said, we, you know, he follows the PWBA really close. And when you guys came back, I was doing the show, and I believe it was 2015 when the PWBA came back. And I heard that announcement at the start of the year in December, I believe it was, right around there in January, that later on there was going to be the PWBA tour back. I was excited because I knew I had the show. I knew I had the venue to get a lot of you guys on. You came on a bunch, and you always helped us out. Uh, when we needed somebody uh, in the storm spot spotlights, you know, uh, segment or just whenever we needed you. So we appreciate you. That's why you're on this show. This is kind of an appreciation show. Uh, Jeff Riggle's coming up next. Mark London. They've always been there for us. 
And uh, you were one of those people that helped us out in the early days, too. Thank you. I'll always be here for you guys. Keep doing the good work. All right, Deandre, we will let you go. We got to get these other uh, other nobodies on here that are going <laughs> to have to follow you. So uh, Hi, you take care. Yeah. You keep, keep doing what you're doing. And if you would, uh, stop doing those videos where you're tugging on them ropes. You're making us guys look bad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. All right. You have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. You too. All right. With that, Luke, I think I better take a commercial break here and step aside for a moment. So we're going to take a moment here and uh, bring back Bobby Jackson's. Uh, is it Bobby Jackson's dot com? Is it, am I missing something in that website? Bobby, yeah, I, probably. I, I think it I, is Bobby Jackson's. Well, he's going to read me the right yeah, for that. Well, about, to, about to show you here. Let's step so. aside and uh, we'll hear from our sponsor. Jackson's Trading is the place to sell all your unwanted precious metals, including broken gold and silver jewelry. They also buy old silver and gold coins, so check them out for all your buying and selling needs. Also, did you know that Bobby Jackson's Trading pays top dollar for your unwanted gift cards? You know the ones your grandma got you for Christmas? Bobby Jackson's Trading is located on 23rd Street, just one block east of Nolan Road in Independence, Missouri. They're open seven days a week. Check them out at bobbyjacksons.com or give Bob Foster a call at 816-463-1919. That's 816-463-1919. All right, welcome back to The Bowler Show. Dave Waswell and Luke Rosedahl. Actually, Luke, we need to take a quick moment and talk about where we're at right now. Yep. Um, we had a tournament here today at Aaron's Family Fun Center. Mike Soroka is the manager, and he has generously allowed us to use the den. I know you've broadcast from in here before. Yep. What a great venue. I know we got the great background behind us here. Actually, I haven't even looked at the screen. That is amazing. So Yeah, yeah, it looks great. You need they, to put uh, a in your basement when you get an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. No, why when they, they offer it to us like this? And uh, so, yeah, thanks to Mike Soroka. And uh, the head mechanic, Frank Hall, who helped a little bit with the uh, logistics of internet connection for the show while simultaneously putting a lift chain back on a deck out there. <laughs> Today got a little <laughs> little scrappy at the end, we'll just a, say that. But uh, fun. Nine Finger Frank was there for us, as you have affectionately known here. So yeah. uh, we're going to continue our theme here, Luke. Let me get this sheet out here so I don't yeah. forget. Uh, I didn't really want to give this next guy an introduction, but he begged for one, so we will give it to him. Uh, his main uh, main thing he does is he, he's a writer, and as we know with Matt, uh, it's a passion of theirs. Uh, he is the CEO of 11thFrame.com and really one of the guys who was integral at the start of the Bowler Show. His name is Jeff Riggles. Jeff, welcome back to the Bowler Show. Hey, guys. How you doing? Oh, we're doing great. There you are. Took took a little moment there, and uh, there's your banner in the background. Uh, if you can read that backwards, that is Riggles. <laughs> Proof that I'm a has been. <laughs> I don't even have one of the banners. I, I I you know I'd have to go out and buy one if I had to. I never did win a regional, believe it or not. I know I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, gave so, me that right. one when I retired the first time as a member. Guys like you and McDowell and Step and others out there winning regionals while I was uh, donating to you. So. But uh, seriously, I meant what I said there about what you did back in the day uh, with the Bowler Show. You were always accessible whenever we needed somebody. If we needed to move somebody, hey, I can do whatever on, on Sunday night for you. And you always did. And I just want to start off our interview with saying, uh, we, did, you know, I appreciate that back then. And we appreciate you now. Always a pleasure to be on your guys' show. I've always enjoyed it. Uh, you tackle all the good stories and do it in a very uh, reasonable, rational, thoughtful, nuanced way. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. And you do your stuff too. I know writing, I learned with working with Matt Canizaro last year is a little more difficult than you think. And he asked me to do some things that I just wasn't really good at. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm a little bit better at black clouding people with the video and uh, Matt taught me a lot. So um, take people all the way back. We know you've bowled your whole career, uh, you know, from a young age. Tell us at what point you decided, Hey, I'm going to be a bowling writer when guys like Chuck Pozzano are around and, and really that was a thing and that was a big thing back then. Well, when I was a freshman at UW-Madison, and this is 1980, um, uh, I got asked to the bowling columnist for the Capital Times, which was then the afternoon daily paper in Madison, retired and I got asked to uh, write a column, try, try writing something because I'd done it for a thing called the Kegler Bowling News, which became the 10 pin journal, the Milwaukee and Southern Wisconsin paper. And I wrote about bowling happenings at Village Lanes in Monona, which is where Mark uh, and I grew up. 
and I just, you know, scores and stuff like that. So I had no training whatsoever. I was in political science as my major as a freshman or what I aimed to at UW, but uh, wrote a column and, and got it critiqued by the sports editor <laughs> and realized how far I had to go. And, but I got the bug. Uh, it was fun to do. And the next thing you know, I was out covering high school basketball. It was the winter. It was December of 80 was my first first column in the Cap Times. And the next thing you know, I was covering all kinds of high school sports and stuff for the paper and everything they would allow me to do and uh, switch my major to journalism and uh, was on my way to, uh, you know, what's been, I'm in my fifth decade now. And I've been full time since 1990. Um, but I, from 80 to 90, when I wasn't on the tour, most of the time when I was going to UW and that, I was working full time hours as a stringer or trying to as much as I could. So uh, I got the bug. Uh, you know, it's fun stuff. How do you balance, you know, your full time job as a journalist <laughs> in a real newspaper and then having to do, you know, stories about bowling, as we saw here, they're just coming out and you're having to churn these out as quickly as possible because your people with the blog want, want to see them as quickly as possible. How, how do you balance doing that all day and then doing this on your, what I guess you could say your side job on 11th frame.com? I have no life <laughs> outside of those two things. And if you've seen, I've posted my Fitbit sleeping uh, totals a couple of times in the last, last month or two. And there was last week, the week of all the urethane stuff, I think my high sleep total for that week was like four hours and 25 minutes. So <laughs> I don't know. I basically, it's effectively, I'm working two full-time jobs. That's what it amounts to. I, you know, and I put off all kinds of stuff. I haven't got to ball reviews. And, and I mean, I've got a list of stories hundred miles long. And basically this couple of weeks with the world series and all the urethane stuff and you know, other news that's broken. It's just been, uh, you know, I, I work my 4.30 to 12.30 or 1 o'clock uh, job with the Wisconsin State Journal and then uh, move on to uh, after that, you know, I might hit the gym quick for a swim at, a, at the lap pool or jog if I'm at home working at home that day. And, and then the rest of the day until I collapse is all right and bowling. <laughs> well, I know as soon as I see uh, you posting something at two or three thirty in the morning. It's time for me to go to bed. So that's always a <laughs> something that I use as a little, you know, time time in the back of my my brain. So um, talk talk a little bit about you know people see what you write and and they get on you know the blog and they you know the stuff you write is really in depth. It's not just hey uh, this guy led the tournament. To, uh, you know check it out or whatever. You you really get into the deep stuff. How do you make sure, just as a journalist, that everything that you're doing on there is accurate? Because I know bowlers, you know how they are online. They're ready to just jump on anything. <laughs> even how, it is accurate. Spelling, yeah, even <laughs> spelling errors or whatever. But as far as the, the in-depth part of the uh, story, how, how do you how do you make sure 100% that, that, that you're accurate when you're when you're reporting? Well, I mean, I, I got a journalism degree from one of the best journalism schools in the country, UW-Madison, and I got – more than 40 years experience working for the two daily newspapers in Madison. And I follow all the rules of traditional newspaper journalism, uh, the code of ethics at the paper. The They allow me to do, I mean, 11thframe.com started at the Cap Times online. And then, you know, it wasn't doing anything special for them. It was just a little fun extra stuff that they allowed me to do when we were exploring the digital world in the late 2000s. What would work? What would draw traffic? And then I asked about taking it on its own when, you know, things move in different directions. And I, I was with the digital team at Madison.com between my stints at the two papers. And they weren't interested in it. And, then, oh, yeah, go ahead, take it. And then Flanagan, Mike Flanagan helped uh, hook me up with Brian Burkhart. Uh, who runs the inside bowling stuff, and he became my tech guy, and and we took it uh, on its own. And the only rule was I have to follow all the same ethical stuff that I follow as a full time journalist with the State Journal now. And you know, it's the same stuff. If you don't have a direct source, you got to get two sources. And you know, I mean, anything that I would do that would cause problems uh, at State Journal, I don't do. I follow the same stuff with with 11thframe.com. So it's that's why at the top it says the daily newspaper of bowling, you know, and that's that's what I try to be. Um, I make typos, of course. I don't have an editor. I, I have readers are my editors is my famous hashtag. You know, I transpose letters. I get a date wrong or whatever. But 
guaranteed in however many it's been almost 15 years of doing 11thframe.com now between when it was at uh, the paper and now on its own for 10 years or so now you won't find a uh, serious factual mistake or error that I've made I'm exquisitely careful I don't you know our our motto is don't be first be right and uh, I don't care if somebody gets something like the specter this weekend yeah that there was stuff out there on friday evening um about it and there was no story on 11thframe.com until 7 a.m on saturday when i had it nailed down that this was legit and there really was something and i haven't i mean i i write what's true what's factual what i can source what i know that i could stand on and that i mean that's just what you're supposed to do and there's lots of media out there that isn't like that both in bowling and of course across across the universe there's plenty of plenty of stuff that isn't any good and isn't trustworthy but your local daily newspaper is still your local daily newspaper and for the most part is the one news source most people could trust if they um investigated it all right go back to the bowling part and then how how is, does one buy the blog yeah, well, it's uh, at 11thframe.com. If you click on a story, it's going to come up. It's probably going to show you two graphs, maybe three, um, and then it's going to say subscribe. Or you can just go to it, and there's a button up in the in the upper left corner, I believe, that you can subscribe. And it's uh, $1.99 a month or $19.99 a year, which is $1.66 a month. So I'm not getting rich off of this by any means. I did the the pricing because I wanted to be able to pay Brian Burkhart for the hours of tech work he put into it to give him some compensation for that it was the only way I had to do it. And I also pre pandemic was using the money I made to uh, travel to the World Series of Bowling and various other PBA events uh, to be able to cover them in person. And uh, hopefully, uh, now that things are pretty much over, um, uh, we'll be back out there on the road, and I would have been in Milwaukee at some point in these two weeks if it weren't for urethane bowling balls. But uh, <laughs> needless to say, my my last two weeks uh, there hasn't been any. I mean, I don't know when I would have got down there, and uh, and I'm not taking any time off from the paper during this period. So, like going to a show Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night here would not have been feasible for me because I have to be up at 3 a.m. to work the next day, and basically then it would have been zero sleep instead of three or four hours to drive to Milwaukee and back. So it just didn't work out. I, I had really planned that I was going to go down today and be at the World Championship live, but I fell so far behind and stuff, I just realized I needed this whole weekend to catch up. And I think I wrote about nine stories this weekend and did a bunch of personal stuff like finishing my taxes and stuff that I've been putting off for a couple of weeks that were on the, the Susie honeydew list. So we, we, we basically just did that all for this weekend and, and, it, and it's okay because I would have loved to have been there and seen that show today. It was fabulous, but you know, I, I wrote like two stories. I wrote about the 900 and finished off a high school one. This all happened while I'm watching the world championship, you know, and I'm keeping score. And so it's been, it was a busy day, but what a show, huh? Man. All right, we got a chance to talk to Matt Canazzaro earlier. Obviously, he is out in Vegas at the USBC Nationals. Um, take a moment, talk about your team and uh, some of the changes that you've been able to make here recently, and then uh, let let everybody know your dates and times and uh, when do we get our checks mailed. Um, yeah, uh, May 13th and 14th this year. We're on uh, Don Amorosi's big squad. They take up the whole plaza. Um, and uh they wanted to bowl with us or next to us or whatever a few years ago when we were still pretty good. And they basically, they knew when we bowled every year and they, Don went in and he said, I'm going to take your whole squad. So you're going to go with me. And I said, uh, okay. And he said, well, I, I go, what do you want? He goes, we just want to bowl next to you. So they, and, and it's great for us because he takes care of everything. He's a captain's club guy. He has 50 teams. I don't have to sit there worrying about getting the right squad times in that. Boom, that's taken care of. So we're May 13th and 14th on his big cool, cool squad. And uh, I'll break some news here for you guys. For a variety of reasons, our teams are kind of messed up this year. We have John Witkowski's daughter is graduating from college from TCU that day, that weekend. He's out. So Brett Faulkner's going with him. Steve Richter's getting married on team event day 
long story with parents and dates and getting a church in post pandemic and it's understandable. And um, so we have uh, Scott Brock Baker has been bowling with us for a few years. Um, and Mike Walters also tore his bicep last year when we bowled and he's still not healed. He never had surgery, he kept trying to let it heal. And he's tried to bowl two or three times and it just didn't work out for him. So I think I haven't talked to him in a couple of weeks, but I, after he said he couldn't bowl, he said, I'm out, get somebody. I think he's going to have surgery and he'll be back hopefully next year. Wachowski will cut, those guys will come back. Richter will be back. But this year we have Brock Baker over on our first team. Mark is turning 60 on May 12th. So he's going to be back. So our original five guys will be everybody but me because I don't turn 60 till July. So Brock is going to be on that team. And then I'm going to be with Scott Baker and Tom Howry and Dan Gutford. And little Missouri ties for you guys. This has not been announced publicly, but I'll do it right now because it's all solid. Doug Buer and Larry Stepp are on mm. the second team. <laughs> so there we are here bowling today. We are going to have a good time. That is not, it just got solidified here in the last uh, week or so. And uh, th those two guys are in with us for this year. And uh, then next year, we're moving back a week. I think it's like May 5th and 6th. That's where Don wanted to take the squad. And we're fine with that now that Mark is 60. We had to wait till after May 12th this year. Um, and uh, next year, our original five, the Big Eagle guys, the ones that have won everything, we finally get to be together. Shady, Riggles, Richter, Myers, and McDowell. So next year, we're back together as the geezer crew and uh, see if we could uh, make Chad cry and pull off a uh, historic um, old guy's miracle. Not very unlikely, but uh, it would be fun. But it's going to be a great fun. Larry and Doug this year two of my best friends in the entire world. I have so many memories with them and, and had so many years of, of, you know, fun times and <laughs> crazy times, believe me. And uh, to bowl with those two guys this year is just going to be a riot. I can't wait. All right, Jeff, we've seen you post a couple of pictures of some new pieces from Storm Roto. I'm going to step aside. I'm going to let uh, Luke take over here for the last couple of questions of the show or of this segment. And uh, he's going to talk to his fans of the show. No, I know nothing about the equipment. I'm terrible <laughs> ambassador on that end. So I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Luke. Yeah, I was going to ask you about when you were going to get the, uh, I guess it'd be team name uh, Raisin Squad or something like that back <laughs> together for the, when you guys were out of timeout and allowed to <laughs> get back I, I can't, together. I can't wait until next year unless he, they come up with another rule to stop us, but uh, I don't <laughs> think they have any reason to, but we're going to have a good time. However we bowl, we're going to have a good time. We're going to go into our twilight years together, and uh, we'll go out on our own terms one of these years, and but we'll have some fun for a few years. Yeah, and I, I want to take another – I want to take a minute here to, to talk a little bit more 11thframe.com because – I. <clears throat> You know, I've, I've kind of got the same thing. I have my day job and then I have the YouTube channel, and whatever else. And I spend more time probably at my YouTube job than my day job. <laughs> Love those and, reviews, by the way. I don't I'm terrible. I don't even do video reviews. Well, so. yeah, but you don't you don't have the time. I, I get yeah. I, I think I get significantly more sleep than you do. And <laughs> um, but I mean, for for 20 bucks a year. This, and the stories, you're always on top of everything. You have a story about everything. You make sure, again, I, I love the the integrity of the thing. That you're, you're not just, like you said, you want to be correct. You don't want to be first. You want to get the right information out there. Sometimes it takes a little bit of digging, but I'm just always impressed with the amount of information, the amount of research you've done, how many you managed to get out there. It takes me long enough to write a review for a video. I for just one, let alone all this stuff all the time. So, and I know that uh, social media makes things fun too. I know that Bella and the incinerator are <laughs> hanging out, waiting for a uh, waiting for anybody, but how do you, how do you balance that too? Because that's kind of the more, that that's something that's kind of interesting in there too, is you, you write the stories, but then you have the social media side of it and you want to, allow people to say what they're going to say, but at the same time, you also need to kind of say, if somebody crosses the line, you need to protect your viewers and, you know, people from uh, internet trolls, shall we say. So how do you, how do you kind of balance and manage that? 
Well, I, I just have I just have a few simple rules. Don't attack people personally. Like, don't go at each other on there and make it personal. Don't f bomb on my Facebook page. There's lots of people don't want to see that. And don't come to my page and spread misinformation. I don't care what anyone writes on their own page. It's their property. It's like I don't go into other people's houses and deface them. You know, so don't come into mine and deface mine. Come into mine and be respectful. Make arguments uh make good cases don't attack other people don't f bomb i no problem with that at all if you're going to come into my page and spread misinformation you're going to be gone i don't go into any I, basically i don't ever go on anyone else's facebook page unless i'm tagged or it's a friend and i'm making you know it's happy birthday and you know we're talking beer or someone asked me yeah. a question or that sort of thing i don't go and post a bunch of you know, my I don't my I never post my stories anywhere but the IBMA page, uh, Keith Dumphy's Open Championships page, the uh, official unofficial PBA message board, and my page. Those four, unless somebody asks for it or shares it or something like that. So I stick to my own page for you know anything controversial in that, unless someone asks me about it. And I just other people should do that. You have your own page, write it whatever you want. Tell me about. Uh, Bill Gates is microchipping vaccines and whatever other <laughs> lunacy you happen to believe that the earth is flat or whatever. And just keep it on your own page. I'm never going to bother you. And uh, just don't bring it over on mine. And then uh, same with bowling. Don't don't come in and start on some thread, start, you know, saying ridiculous and absurd stuff about any company or any bowling. Yeah, I know. Uh, Storm always tells us to take the high road. H-Y-R-O-A-D. Um, but sometimes, the, and I, I've kind of struggled with that too, because I don't want to just banner block somebody. And then of course, you know, have them go off and say whatever they want to say. But at the same time, taking the high road can also be, like I said, protecting your viewers, readers, listeners, whatever else from that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a fun line to walk sometimes, but it's part of the deal. Yeah. I mean, taking the high road is, is, is the only way anybody should go. And it involves, you know, also standing up for what's right and what's mm -hmm. the truth. And that's the high road, too. And you don't have to be personal. And, you know, I, I write about all kinds of other bowling companies, you know, and I I have given all the praise in the world to bowlers like EJ Tackett, who's on Motive and, you know, and Tommy Jones winning, you know, shooting 300 on his Hall of Fame, one of my favorite all time stories. So, you know, that that's that's taken the high road and and. If you go back in history, the, the, one of the things I've written for years is bowling needs lots of strong companies. And it, as much as it might be on the bottom line, if Storm like knocked all the other companies out, that wouldn't be good for bowling. I mean, we've gone down so far that now we basically only have three major companies. We don't want to go any lower than that. We want, um, who's the new one? Pardon me, uh, Marshalls, Big Bowling. Uh, yeah, We'd big like bowling. to see them you know, grow stronger and bigger and have bowling grow. So there's more customers and more people buying bowling balls so that all these companies, so everyone can prosper. That's what we all want. You know, that benefits storm and it benefits Brunswick and EB, you know, EBI and motive. And we need growth and, and you can be friendly competitors who work together to grow the sport. And, and that to me, that's the high road. All right, Jeff, before we let you go, Luke, was that all you had? Yeah, that's all I had. All right, before we let you go, let the viewers know once again uh, where they can find the blog and where they can find you all over social media. Yeah, um, well, it's uh, www.11thframe.com, and that's 11th frame um, for for the site. And uh, I'm at Jeff Riggles on Facebook, and I'm one of the moderators or administrators or whatever with a few other guys of the official unofficial pro bowling message board and we run a tight ship there mm -hmm. when it says only about pro bowling content don't come in there and try to fundraise don't come in there and try and post a ball review it's about pro bowling content only so you know when you go there you're not going to get inundated with all the other garbage that's on so many other pages because there's a zillion pages where you can get all that so rant over there and uh you know i I have, I'm on Twitter at Jeff Riggles. That's actually my account blue check mark through the newspaper, through capital newspapers. Um, now that, now that I'm with the state journal. So I uh, use that for both work and bowling and everybody, everybody manages that. Okay. And then, uh, and I'm on Instagram, but the only Instagram post I've ever made 
<laughs> was done by Mike Flanagan up at the PWBA tour about five years ago in Green Bay at Ashwaubenon. So I just don't have enough time and I'm not on TikTok and all the, I mean, it's enough. I don't have enough time to go beyond basically Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, I always find it amazing when people are like, well, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you bowling the PBA 50? Why aren't you doing that? You don't have any time. People, yeah. if they don't see your posts about uh, the non-sleep or, or all the stuff you're writing about, then they, they have no idea what you're doing still. Um, we're going to, we're going to have to step aside here. We got one more guest on today. He's also a writer in Mark London. So Jeff, once again, I want to thank you for coming on tonight and thank you for everything you did for us in the original bowler show. Um, you were an integral part of that. And as I said, always available anytime I needed you and, uh, you will always add something to the show. And tonight you broke a couple of stories about your team. So that's, uh, that's great stuff. <laughs> I feel kind of bad about that. I hope nobody gets mad, but everybody around, you know, the people had, it was e leaking out. So it's fine. It's going to be a good time. And I'm, whenever you guys uh, want me, I'm available to you. I'm so glad you're back. Uh, love the Sunday night and following up on uh, tournament weekends and, and getting, getting news out there when it's hot and uh, uh, looking forward to, to hopefully you guys having another long run. All right. You keep doing what you're doing. We'll keep doing what we're doing and get the uh, news out of the bowling uh, to the bowling world. So, Jeff, once again, thanks uh, for everything you've done for bowling and thanks everything for, for everything you've done for us. And you have a good night, sir. You too. Have a good night. Yeah, right. we'll have a we'll have a sour beer with you one of these times. <laughs> Maybe if I can't sit down with you, we might have to coordinate something. And yeah, have, have all <laughs> we can have one <laughs> during the during the show or something. So thank you much. And we will uh, talk to you next time. All right. Maybe you can make it out to nationals and uh, take, take Larry with it. And you guys can partake in a few of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Without further ado, let's bring in our final guest, Luca. Once again, uh, did you, did you think that two hours would ever go this fast in your life? Um, the, just, didn't it just seem like we were talking to Mike Flanagan, Chris Brather, Matt yeah, Canizaro yeah. uh, and, and Deandra and all these people. All of a sudden, it's almost eight o'clock. Actually, we've we've all, almost run out of time. So, unfortunately, yeah, uh, yeah. we've used some time <laughs> here. Yeah, and uh, Mark London is waiting in the wings here. Oh, uh, you do not have your WLS radio show intro. You're going to have to do that yourself. Uh, you know him as the columnist for <laughs> the Bowling News, and uh, just paying attention. We've been paying attention all show. Waiting for you to uh, bring us home, Mark. So uh, tell us what's going on. Wow, two hours. I mean, uh, I, I I want to apologize to Deandra. I mean, I I know my name was on the list. I mean, are you sure? I mean, really, I'm just you know, <laughs> just name another answer. But I'd say what? Uh, ah, there you go. That's that's very kind of you. But um, I want to give a quick shout out here to uh, uh, Stephen Casella for. Uh, his 900 series uh, today. I called him um, Lou earlier. Yeah. I think I called him Lou. <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of, we're kind of, we're kind of tight. That's my set, nickname. Set the record straight is, uh, here. So, Stephen know. Luke. <laughs> I, uh, I thought about that earlier. I was kind of looking at Luke thinking that hey, I don't think that's the right name. So we were running a tournament yeah, here all day. So it, mm, I'm, that's my yeah. excuse. Uh, Jeff Riddles Just actually it. said he would step mm. aside for us if we need be, but, uh, we'll get in contact with Lou next week and Steven, uh, maybe get him on the show. Now, it's it's, it's, it's going to be Lou from now. It's going to be Lou. Okay, AC yeah. Lou that, me, that's so. going to be code. All right, Mark, this is this is similar to the shows we had back in the day where, uh, you know, we, we get delirious toward the end of the show. We've talked to the bowling dignitaries, and we come to yourself. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, I know you're, yeah. you're still hanging around the bowling world, so uh, give the viewers an idea yes. of what, what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, well, for those of you uh, who have read the column in the past, you saw uh, recently that Tony and Jeannie Franklin, the owners and publishers of the Bowling News of Texas, have decided to do just a monthly newspaper uh, because their young daughter, Tori, uh, now 14, has become quite a phenomenal bowler herself, as, um, and they're doing you know, tournaments on weekends and such, so uh, we're just back to uh, a monthly uh, publication. So the, the latest one just came out. I just had it here just a moment ago. Uh, the March publication is now available as we do the John Candy Memorial Zoom yeah, yeah. <laughs> at uh, thebowlingnews.net. That's where to uh, find all the uh, 
uh, Southwest and Dallas Fort Worth area Boeing news on a monthly basis. And Mark, that publication isn't just a you know a, a one or two page <clears throat> thing. Uh, I get the emails oh, no, and no. Uh, try to read them, and that there is a lot of content in there. This month, Mar the Mar March issue is twenty pages. So the monthly issues that used to come out uh, on the first uh, weekend, the first week of each month, are were generally twenty four, uh, and then the other ones were usually sixteen to twenty two. But still, there's uh, there's quite a bit of news in there. Uh, in fact, in this month, uh, Tony and Jeannie talk about. Uh, how they were uh, attending uh, the P PBA Hall of Fame ceremonies two weeks ago when their good friend uh, Wes Mallott got inducted. And Robert Lawrence uh, was able to introduce him to the crowd to, uh, <clears throat> as the latest Hall of Famer. So, um, you know, they, they know a lot of people. Uh, so there, there's certainly not a uh, shortage of content in uh, the bowling news. And it's been around for, you know, over 60 years. So uh and it's got a great uh, great print readership they distribute roughly fifteen thousand copies a month uh to centers all over the southwest so uh hope it keeps going and i it's kind of odd not having anything to do on saturdays other than just write the column and get it done and get it in uh but uh, there's there's always 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 stuff to, to talk about there's the television ratings on fox in April, I'm going to uh, hopefully have some time to uh, uh, turn around a review of Tom Smallwood's sitcom, which I kind of find it funny that Fox, uh, the last two weeks, briefly mentioned. It's sort of like the old days uh, on the old, yeah. when Johnny Carson used to host The Tonight Show, he used to say to a guest that was appearing on a show on another network, not mentioning the name, but yet uh, for promos for like the USFL, they said on oh, games on Fox and NBC. So okay, whatever, fine. Let's let's draw the line here or something or other. But uh, but there's just a whole lot of uh, always a lot of news. I mean, the uh, television ratings have just been uh, outstanding uh, compared to. I mean, I, I I harken back to where we were, you know, 15 years ago when we were up against NFL football on Sunday afternoons at 12 noon Central. So you literally have to you know, tape the show or DVR it and then watch it at, uh, at a later date or at least later in the afternoon. But, uh, those, those times, uh, those times are hopefully in our rear view mirror for a long, long time. All right, Mark, we talked to Matt Canizaro earlier about nationals. Uh, take a moment, tell us your plans for nationals and, uh, take us back to, uh, the thrilling days of yesteryear when Matt Canizaro <laughs> plowed you for a 299. Uh, yes, that's that's on YouTube forever, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> oh, well. At, at, at least my helicopter nine-pin strike is up there. That's probably one of the top five strikes of my career. Uh, but as far as nationals going, uh, I unfortunately sprained my, my other ACL. Now I'm two for two in that. So uh, still not physically able to... Uh, to get more than six games in at a time without having to sit down for a while. So before uh, five years ago, it was the left one. Now it's the right one. Uh, and I'm turning 60 this year too. So it's not getting any easier. So uh, hopefully I can rejoin Tom Carter's group and, uh, and be part of that fun. Some, some years soon, hopefully again, hopefully next year. All right. I, I'm, I'm a little out of the loop. Talk, talk to us uh, about, uh, who you're with on on staff, or if you're with anybody still, and and a little bit about the pro shop. Well, Cherry Lane's pro shop is in uh, Cherry Lane's inside Diamond Joe Casino in Dubuque, Iowa, uh, as I like to call it, uh, down the street from the Field of Dreams. And uh, what's that other phrase I was thinking about? It was uh, oh yes, uh, high above the downtown Burger King. So <laughs> that's. Uh, I kind of superimpose that a little bit there anyway but um the uh, pro shop is still fairly busy we have a lot of guys uh even though league is finishing up they're looking to bowl uh, iowa state tournament wisconsin state tournament uh not too much illinois although we're kind of where those three states come together uh so we'll, it'll be pretty busy for about the next probably about four weeks or so i'll be, dr I'll be drilling balls a couple days a week there still on staff with motive still on staff with turbo Glad they're having me. Um, 
moving the product as, as best we can. There's some great products with, with both companies and just proud to represent both. All right. Well, we've stayed on track way too long for us uh, in bowling. So, uh, before I give it over, uh, hand it over to Luke, uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, your favorite football team and uh, how they didn't get a quarterback in this offseason. Uh, well, I actually I don't think we've discussed this much. I, I may have, might have mentioned it. I talked to uh, a former member of said team and um he said, yeah, there's definitely going to be some transition going on. I wish I had a picture that I could, wow. I could show uh, reasonably. But um, um, I did talk with the one and only Rocky Blyer, Vietnam veteran, knew his story well when I was growing up back there, not far from Aliquippa where that 900 was shot earlier today. But um, he said, yeah, it's it, it could be, you know, there's always wide receivers to throw to, but you got to have a guy who's – somewhat mobile in the pocket yeah. not sure about mason rudolph we'll see how training camp goes but he's probably going to be the starter this year um but uh i, I did get a few other great stories i did uh, rocky was in town for a, a, a veterans uh, tribute uh, at the university of dubuque just down the street from me here and he performed his play uh, he has a one-man show that's a roughly an hour and a half discussing his life where he's been uh, being wounded in Vietnam, having to come back after two rough years, and then all of a sudden gets to be with the team that wins four Super Bowls in, in six years, uh, and, and through and through the through the seventies, through uh, the greatest era in team history. So, uh, quite quite the inspirational story. Although I'll I'll have to I may have to uh, divulge part of. I asked him the final question after after an hour and a half. Okay, Rocky, you were on the field. Did Franco really catch the ball for the immaculate reception? And he laughed at that. And he said, "Well, he doesn't know. He he honestly doesn't know." And and I'm the oddest thing. And in fact, he's he's got an ice bowl story too. Um, he was at he was at that game as well. But as far as the immaculate reception, he it was fourth down. He he's just going okay. I'm not not don't have a good feeling. So I'm just going to turn away and, and look at the crowd. And all of a sudden there's this huge roar. Uh, and then he knew it was a, a good roar and he ran into the end zone, uh, jumped on uh, everybody else, pilot on Franco and having no idea what happened. Uh, he said he saw Franco cross the goal line, but what happened prior to that? No idea. I had, had to check the film and all that. So I'll, I'll be writing about that in, in the, in the December of just paying attention along with a few, a few other things uh, as, as my special year end column goes. All right. Well, we've kept up our uh, tradition of uh, getting off the rails. So let's get back to bowling. Oh, this, here. this circa okay. 2022. <laughs> well, I looked over at our viewers and once we started talking about the Steelers instead of the Chiefs, we started losing viewers. So <laughs> let's get back to bowling. Oh, uh, well. Actually, I'm going to turn it over to, to my partner here in a moment. But uh, other than the 299, whatever, what other uh, shining moments have you had uh, at USBC Nationals? And you can talk about your own bowling or just some of the trips that you made uh, outside. Well, I, I think two stand in uh, two stand out. Uh, 2014 was just one game, really. Uh, we have we had the. Um, we had the live stream with uh, Matt and Aaron's uh, excellent adventure uh, describing the action with uh, Tom Carter and Wayne Webb and Skip Wolf and, and uh, Craig Splett, who's thrown three 300s at Nationals, first guy to do it. Um, so we're out there bowling uh, doubles and singles, and we're thinking, well, Wayne Webb's going to be the star of the show. All of a sudden, the first game in singles, and I've got the front six, seven, eight. I'm feeling as relaxed as I am right now, so I get up for the 10th frame. Um, throw that helicopter knot where the head pin came off the wall, spun like a helicopter blade, knocked the nine down. And uh, I thought I flushed the last shot. It was a little light, left a dime. But anyway, but the other two years, uh, 2007, 2010, were uh, team-related events. Uh, 2007, I got lucky and got hot for nine games, started carrying for the first time at Nationals and finished fourth in all events. But the most fun was the the team portion where the the – our two teams, Tom Carter's Bowlers Universe one and two, were bowled on the same pair. I think it was twenty-seven and twenty-eight to the left of the catwalk, the stadium, and we're both we both get lined up, and all ten guys are just firing, just strike, 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 and we're thinking, 
okay, who's who's gonna, you know, one of us is probably gonna take the lead here. Let, let's see what happens. A little bit. Let, let's just, you know, hit the all button and have some fun with it. I think at the time uh, we there one team was fourth, the other one was ninth. Uh, but I had uh, the front 10 the last, uh, yeah, the front nine in game three, uh, if team, I need the first hit in the 10th for eight. And all of a sudden I just get up there and thought I threw it okay, but I saw the ball flatten out. And it was, it was a ring 10, probably one of four 10 pins I've left in that building that I would love to have back. So I shot 790. And then we go on to, uh, to the next day uh, where I threaten the 90 clean and get within a Nats eyelash and flag a dime in the yeah. ninth frame of the last, uh, last game. So I end up with 88. The front 88, but I had 42 the previous year, uh, so it's 130 clean over two years. And you know, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I keep asking Matt every so often, "Hey, is there somebody else who's threatened that?" And he's never heard of anything even close, or anybody's even mentioned it. So I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that all right. But uh, but the, the the two teams, I mean, it was it was just so wonderful. All ten of us were talking amongst each other what we're seeing, what we try to do in the next shot. It was just so much fun. That's where the term unadulterated adrenaline came out uh, was when we were doing that. It was just, just so darn fun to be part of that. And then in 2010, uh, the team I was on, and we're bowling with Webb on uh, his anchor, the other team, we made a run at uh, team again. And we're getting down, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. All of a sudden we get to about the seventh and eighth frame and guess who shows up with his video camera. So <laughs> guys are thinking, Oh no, Oh no. You know, I'm going, all right, let's, Hey, the camera here, let's, okay. let's go. Let's, let's do this. You know, th this doesn't happen every year. And it just, it just did not, uh, we, we fell a little bit short. I think we're 30 pins. We finished in sixth, uh, but still it was, it was, that, that was just a blast. Uh, just again, that visit to, uh, a different type of adrenaline. Well, I checked my own records real quick while nobody was looking. And um, I actually have 130 clean frames also, but that's overall over 24 years. So, um, I've never done that well out there. Mark, uh, in the interest of not getting any further off the rails, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Luke, and uh, he's got a couple of questions for you. Oh, good deal. And, and, and before we get started, I do have a special bit that I tried to do on the last time I was on, but I was not uh, not available. We have a special top 10 list for the bowler show uh, that I wrote uh, five years ago. <laughs> uh, very much bowling? so. Okay. No, no, it is, it is. Yeah, go for it. It's, it's, bowler, sh it's bowler show related. So that, that's that's even better. Oh, there you go. I'm a little, little bit, yeah, a little bit scared. Then. <laughs> I'm a little bit frightened, I'm not gonna lie. So uh, you wanna take care of that first or you wanna do, do that to close out the show? <laughs> let's, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll close the show with that. All right. Well, the what do you uh, got, Luke? Well, the the ninety clean thing is kind of interesting because um, Jeff Riggles is one of three people ever. Period. I, I was I was looking up that er earlier, and so uh, just getting a thirty clean, just so just having just having the one set clean would be a big enough deal. But uh, there's only three people that have ever done ninety clean, so getting anywhere close to that is just just ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. But uh, um, as far as the, as far as the writing goes, I do a little bit of writing myself and it's, it just always stuns. I'm, I'm the type of person that when I go to read an article, I read absolutely every single word and I look how you phrase things and talk about things. I know you say you, you have plenty to plenty to talk about. This might be a little bit of a broad question, but how do you figure out what you want to, what you want to write about? And then how much do you, do you have somebody that edit it, edits, edits it for you or do you kind of read it a million times or how, just kind of what's your process for, for writing an article from figuring out what you're going to write about to actually, you know, getting it in uh, publication? Well, first thing is it's, it's a lot of media. Uh, it's a lot of, I've been stunned over the years and I've been, you know, I, I did a story on Charlie Tapp in college nearly 40 years ago. That's where, that's where I started with all this, but, but there's, there seems to be a, a, a disconnect between mainstream media and professional bowling, even though mm -hmm. it's been on since the, since the sixties, there just seems to be some non interrelation thing going on a couple times that that bridge is closed, like during the, uh, like I wrote in the last column on the anniversary of the Pete McCordick 300 game, it was 
on ESPN. That it rarely featured uh, highlights. It was on CNN Sports Play of the Day, which never did anything about bowling. But uh, it was kind of a perfect storm. It was after the Super Bowl. It wasn't quite in the mid- it was NBA and NHL were in the middle of their season. So you had this wonderful moment, uh, a 300 game for $100,000, the first one. And it got a lot of attention. I mean, it seemed like that whole season in 87, Chris Schenkel mentioned it every single week. And I think if you go back and watch the shows, I think, I really, I think he did. Uh, couldn't talk enough about it to, uh, to publicize him and uh, True Value Hardware, who sponsored all that. Uh, but also, uh, the whole premise of the column, just paying attention, uh, it goes back almost, well, this is the 25th year now. Uh, if bowling were a major sport, how would somebody cover it? Well, Riggs does all, all the heavy lifting, and I do a lot of the fe- uh, the feature stuff. Uh, like, I look at columnists like uh, Mike Royko or the Chicago Tribune or Rick Tellender of, of the Sun-Times, who had uh, columns in three or four days a week writing about different things, uh, mostly sports, uh, some personal stuff, uh, but still somehow with uh, a bowling twist in there, a bowling tie to, to tie it all together. Now, for example, the one of my favorite ones was about the ice bowl. Now, how does bowling and the ice bowl get you know together like that? Well, here's how. The ice bowl featured the losing team, the Dallas Cowboys. DFW's team has, has been for a long time, as you very passionate fans, blah, blah, blah. We all know that. Well, the... I had seen on uh, Jolene Lawson's, <clears throat> who is, is the co-owner of uh, Lomar Bowling Supply, her maiden name was Dowler. And I, and I thought, wait a minute, wasn't there a Packer with that name? So I just, out of, out of the blue one day, asked her, hey, did you have a relative who played for the Packers in the 60s? Oh, yeah, Uncle Boyd, yeah. And I'm thinking, there's my column for the end of 2017 on the 50th anniversary of that game. I got to write something about that. Now, part of that goes back too to the uh, twenty to a uh, November twenty thirteen edition of the Bowling News, and I never have seen any other bowling paper do anything close to this. They there they had a paper out. It's always dated on Thursday, and it was on the fiftieth anniversary of JFK's assassination. Tony and Jeannie asked different people, like Jamie Brooks and other longtime DFW bowling people what they were doing that day. And I'm thinking, this is a bowling paper. Why would you, you know, but hey, that's that's how they go. That's how they roll. So let's go for it. So um, I think we're going to see another chapter unfold once Tom Smallwood's sitcom premieres on uh, March 31st on, on CBS. I think it's 8.30 Central Time uh, to see how, see if anybody's going to watch it. I know television is a little different these days with a thousand channels of streaming and broadcast and everything else, but it's, it's how bowling is perceived. We're sort of perceived as sort of a circus or sideshow, but it trying to get us to be a little more serious about ourselves. And we always have been, uh, but as far as pushing, you know, bowling's going to be just part of the, the storyline, uh, and how he has overcome and, and that whole project, which John Mark Manzione covered greatly in uh, the March, or the March uh, Bullish Journal that's just out this week, um, going uh, talking with different people, and the, the project was going to be a movie. Now it's a sitcom, but it's been going on for you know ten years plus. So now that we can get involved in stuff like that, and I can even remember writing a column about things that we needed to do to get bowling a little more visible. Yep. And even ha- having somebody like like Pete Weber host Saturday Night Live, how you know? Oh, but but he but he he's a personality. I think yeah. he might be able to do it <laughs> if he gets into that wrestling persona. He might be able to do it. But yeah. um, and there the, uh, and and remember that push to get Kelly Kulik uh, to be on Dancing with the Stars. Well, unfortunately, uh-huh. the tour segments on both tours, and she was on both a couple years ago. Um, it would not have worked out. She would have had to just drop the tour for, you know, six weeks or eight weeks and, and go do that. But, you know, I think she could have done that too. But um, there just, again, seems to be that that, that disconnect that you see um, all too often that's slowly going away, but it's, but it's still kind of there. Yeah. All right, Mark, why don't we uh, uh, 
wrap this up here with your top 10 list. Uh, the YouTube and okay. the SEC is telling us we're going way too long on this show. So <laughs> let's, uh, well, let's, let's well, this is Big Tech that, on that owns – that owns. Uh, we're not under any FCC regulation that I know of uh, so far. Not uh, yet. No, no cursing allowed and, on the show. No, 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 no. We, we right. keep it clean. We use a microphone like we're talking in church. You know, there's certain words you don't say. Anyway. Right. Uh, okay, here we go. And now for the first and only time from the home office uh, somewhere uh, down the street from the Field of Dreams with contributions from the branch offices in Beaver, PA, Galesburg, Illinois, and St. Cloud, Minnesota. My regular readers know all about those places. Here are the top 10 after effects of the Bowler Show leaving the air. Now, this is five years ago, so we have to, you know, go back a little bit here. Uh, number 10. Start your Anton Fig drum roll. Number 10, no longer need those annoying 4 a.m. wake-up calls. Oh, wait, that would be for a 5 a.m. show. Sorry, this is a 6 p.m. show, so no need for that. Uh, number nine, the segment host, me, can wear clothing other than laundry day clothing late Sunday afternoons because it was audio only. So I'd yeah. sit in my car in laundry clothes and, and do my 20 minutes. Number eight, there is a tie. We have two number eights. Uh, this may end the confusion and mock feud between Matt Canizero and Matt McNeil on who the Super Matt theme song is really for. You know, that's that's been a that's been a pickle between them for a while. And the other number eight uh, segment host, me, will finally stop dropping his Ron Burgundy hair and oh, I had ribs for lunch references. And that, that'll be good. Number seven. Those award-winning segments with Aaron Smith devoted to the best micro brews of the world. Wait a minute. That idea will never leave a post-it note. Rumor has it Smith has now signed on with Netflix for a sitcom featuring beer. So, okay. Uh, number six, uh, border operator Mark Graves will finally be able to get tendonitis treatments on his arms for all the frantic waving on the other side of the glass, as Waz <laughs> says, after many of the segments. Uh, Luke, yeah, hopefully you won't have, have that issue. Yeah. Um, number five, number five, show host Waz uh, will break into uncontrolled rage every time he hears the dulcet tones of John Sebastian. <laughs> that was bumper music that we would play between segments, uh, mm -hmm. his welcome back Cotter theme. Uh, number four, may have to use factual weather forecasts from WLS AM Radio Chicago. Oh, by the way, those numbers I always use are 99.2% accurate. And if you're curious, it's going to be uh, mostly cloudy, lows in the 30s, highs in the 50s with a chance of rain on Tuesday. Right now, 48 uh, at O'Hare, 49 at Midway, and 50 high above the downtown Burger King at WLS. Uh, number three, there is a tie for this one, too. So we actually have 12. Number three, the first one, show hosts may have difficulty finding uses for the phrase, welcome back to the bowler show. Can't use that all the time. We can now, but again, this was at the end of the 1.0 version. Uh, the other number three, end rumors, segment host hopscotching to different segment. That's me because I would hopscotch to different parts of the show. Uh, I would demand that just to be difficult. You know, got to be a diva somewhere. Uh, number two, Adam Barta offers a friendly weekly wager on the total series with Waz being able to use a six-game total while Barta sticks with a three-game total. And by the way, let's, let's give a shout out to Adam. I hope I hope he's feeling better after uh, he's he's had some kidney stone issues. Uh, Adam, I hope we're, we're behind your brother, a fellow Yinzer. Oh yeah, he yeah. He, I can tell you what his favorite football team is too. Ah, aha. and finally, the number one effect after effect of the Bowler Show leaving the air. Former Royals manager Ned Yost will start to call Waz in spring tra training for pitching advice. This is when he was still managing. In the meantime, Yost will secretly trademark Waz's common phrase Facebook page, pull him, Ned. <laughs> and now, then, play, play, your, play your drum and get out of the segment. Uh, all right, I'm going to give you a oh. real, quick, real quick critique. Uh, you can't have two number eights in a top ten. You should go to uh, number six and not number seven. So you actually we, had a top 11. And, the, uh, oh, it was, Ned, it was 12. It was 12. Oh, okay. Well, the Ned Yost reference is leave him in, Ned. <laughs> it's actually, although it means pull him out, it's leave him in, Ned. So those are, those are the critiques I had for the segment. But, Mark, we do got to get out of here. I appreciate you uh, doing what you did for so many years there, especially towards the end of the show when we 
you know, to be perfectly honest, uh, that's part of the reason why we stopped the bowler show. It just got kind of stagnant. And with some of the PBA telecasts not being on Sunday, we just didn't have a lot of content. So we, you know, we decided it was time to, to take it off. So um, you helped out Matt with his 640 segment back in the day and yourself with your, your 740 uh, helped out a lot. So we appreciate you coming on this nostalgic edition uh, of the Bowler Show with some of the people uh, in the past who helped out originally. So uh, I just want to take a moment and thank you for that. My pleasure. It's 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 always a blast to get the pipes to, uh, tuned up once a week just to uh, <clears throat> pretend like I was a professional radio man for a while. That's right. <laughs> Stay classy, Bowler Show viewers. <laughs> All right, Mark. We appreciate it once again. Tell tell the viewers real quick before we uh, we get you out of here uh, how they can find your musings. Uh, the bowlingnews.net. It's the whole paper. And I'm in. I'm in each each edition. Uh, just paying attention is the column. And there's all, all sorts of other good stuff in there too. Dave Williams writes a great column as well. So check that one out too. All right, sounds good. Check them out, guys. Mark London once again uh, with the Bowling News dot net. Mark, thanks for everything you do for the bowling world, and we will talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. All right. Good, good luck, night, sir. All right, Luke. Version <clears throat> two point oh, season right. two. Uh, uh, what, 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 what episode two? Season one, episode two. Is that we're going to look? Yeah, uh, I've, I've been calling there? it two point whatever. So I might have to two point something point something else, depending on how far we. How far we get in here? Um, I do want to pop something up? We got a super chat, so we got a twenty dollars donation oh, awesome. from uh, Ill Pad. Sorry, I'm late to the show. Got stuck coaching all day. Episode one was amazing, guys. Can't wait to watch the uh, VOD video on demand for <laughs> those from the radio world. Which <laughs> I still, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. uh, can't watch the VOD of today's show for what I have missed. So thanks a bunch. He's one of my. Uh, members and and coaching gurus and admins whatever on my uh my chat server so thanks a bunch to him did have another question here he was asking about uh can you still find anywhere online the previous bowler show archives that was on the sports schmucks page did there is there any way to we had it on a site called podbean and they gave us uh, a little warning because you had to pay for it uh -huh. and uh, said, hey, you, you need to save these or, or they're going away. And pretty much they've all, they've all gone away. Uh -huh. uh, if you go to the Bowler Show site, you can see a couple of interviews that are on the actual Facebook page. I, I'd have to look in there and see what's in there. I know James has a couple interviews from Indianapolis, uh, maybe with Tom Small, who he looks exactly like. He would have been the <laughs> perfect guy uh, for the sitcom. But unfortunately, that didn't work out. But. Uh, yeah, there there really isn't any record of it uh, anymore, other than the little snippets that we have on on the Bowler, uh, Bowler Show Facebook page. So, Ilpad, thank you very much. I know you're a big fan of the breakdown pair, also as as I watch that and see you uh, doing your part, and we really appreciate that. So, yeah, just kind of <clears throat> it's a little bit more relaxed, but <laughs> so it depends on what your depends on what your cup of tea is. So. Hey, that's why that's why or you're your, doing your one glass of beer is rather, I suppose. <laughs> that's why you're doing uh, that with with Jonathan, and and you're doing the a different little venue here. We're getting in, into the interview world. I think you're doing a great job. I know it's it's a you know Mark talked about the the face for radio and stuff. I'm still yeah. having trouble with uh, making face sure for radio I'm, voice for silent film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> looking, I'm, I'm still having trouble with the looking in the camera part. I'm working yeah, on all yeah. the little things. Uh, Angel, who is our producer and our uh, basically our rock for getting these guys on the show. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Angel, how many ums have I said during the show? 312. You said was a recent count. Is that correct? Uh, okay, we're at, we're well, at 412. Currently. What we can do is we can. Uh, we, we can get shot callers and those remote shot callers and um <laughs> oh you have a way to toggle her on I, uh, if you did and we definitely need to do that but yeah um that's 413 so that's our final official amount hopefully for the show how about just a, a quarter jar or something if i put a quarter every time i said yeah on. yeah i, I am we not might, a... we might need that tip picture it's not really a jar it's more but and then uh, thanks to Jonathan Hawes, who's been helping in the chat. He's my breakdown pair co-host. How do you do breaking down pairs today? Um, depends on your 
<laughs> Depends on what you mean by breaking down pairs. <laughs> hey, we don't they break anything in errands. We know that. So yeah, yeah. And we did have a, a five dollar donation right here from Mr. James Kniffen. The K is not silent. Super chat. Uh, segment by segment, y'all are getting better. Great show tonight, and excited for next week. Keep up the great work, gentlemen and wise. One of the more dedicated <laughs> guys uh, in the sport of bowling. That guy came from parts unknown in North Carolina to fly into our tournaments. Yeah. And he made the top 36 last year in the points list. And that is quite an achievement. From so North Carolina. Uh, do we already break any news on, on his stuff or should we wait on that? Hey, we can, we can let him, okay, can there's, let him there's, break the news. There's or, some rumors out there. We'll let him, well, maybe we'll yeah, bring yeah. him on the show here once uh, yeah, things yeah. change. So yeah, right. yeah, he will be, be in be town Easter, Easter weekend. So, so. Uh, Luke, you got anything else, or uh, is it time to wrap this thing up? Nope, I think it's time to wrap it up. We got some uh, jambalaya waiting for for us from down the way here at Brew Bakers that we like to hit when we're up here at Aaron's Family Fun Center. Once again, we'll probably we'll sign off by thanking them for the use of this awesome facility. They, uh, Mike Shroka, Frank Hall, always take great care of us here, and uh, when we we have a stream that we do here. Well, for the, the Greater Kansas City Open, which if anybody wants to come to the Greater Kansas City Open, September. <laughs> uh, but we always have a um, the Friday night before the before the weekend. They uh, let me and my group. We have several people that kind of follow my channel or in my discord group that that uh, we put together teams for. And they make it out here and they let us come out here and practice and stream and whatever else for the weekend so that everybody flying in from wherever they're coming in from can kind of get loosened back up. So now yeah, people can see the, the white screens there. Those are actually TVs yep. and they can do all kinds of crazy stuff with that here in the den. So just uh, contact Aaron's family fun center. If you're here in town and ask for Mike's Roca. Uh, I believe that's going to do it for this week's show. We want to yep. also thank storm bowling, uh, S and H custom homes, double J's pro shop, cool wick. I am bowling turbo grips and everybody else who has been the support of the show. Uh, thanks to everybody in the chat. Uh, we're going to make a little, uh, a little, I don't know how you would say, it, detour next week. We're going to try to work a little more of the chat in. We've been so interview driven so far with the first couple of shows mm -hmm. with uh, the big names we had last week and then the, the people who helped uh, the show originally. So we'll take, we'll, we'll leave one segment open and we'll really work with the chat a little more next week and we'll put Angel to the task and Jonathan get some of those good questions on the screen. And I'm going to make you answer probably most of them because they're going to be technical questions. Yeah, yeah, that, that works for me. All right, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Bowler Show. Thanks to everybody who's listened in, and thanks to everybody who supports the show and supports bowling. And that is going to do it for episode number two of the Bowler Show.